Okay, members, thank you and welcome to this morning meeting, which I now declare open to the public online. Um, I'd like to welcome members who are participating by video conferencing this morning. And at this point in time, we have on the line Colin McGrath. Um, so we've received no apologies this morning, and um, if members are no, no members aware of any apologies. Thank you. So, members, the minister is here today to provide an update on COVID-19. As the minister has to leave by 10 a.m., I suggest we move to agenda item five straight away to make the best use of that time. Are members content? I'm content. Yeah, thank you. So, members, we will then go to um, item five, which is our COVID-19 disease response ministerial update. I refer members there to papers at tab five of your meeting pack. And I can advise members that the minister and the chief medical officer are here today to update the committee on COVID-19, along with a departmental official who will provide a short briefing on the vaccination programme. So I'd now like to welcome this morning uh, Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan, uh, Dr Michael McBride, Chief Medical Officer, and also this morning Ms Patricia Donnelly, who is Head of COVID-19 Vaccination Programme. So could I ask you, Minister, there, do you want to make a few remarks before we go into the briefing, Minister? Good morning, Chair, and again, uh, as ever, thank you for the opportunity to, to update the committee. Um, and I think since my, my last briefing on the 5th of November, we're all aware that there, there continues to be a significant number of um, COVID positive cases across Northern Ireland. And I think yesterday's figure of, of 416 positive cases is still too high. And that's why the current two week period of restrictions is still so important. Uh, it's not a time for societal complacency. We must all remain vigilant and, and do what we can to protect ourselves um, and the community around us. As members are aware and have updated the, the Assembly as well as, well as the committee, you know, work on test, test and protect is continuing and progresses at pace. And as part of a, a UK wide programme, we are continuing uh, with the implementation of a number of new testing interventions or NPIs, as, as they've been referred to here in Northern Ireland. Uh, one example we can give is the testing of asymptomatic healthcare workers, which is due to come in shortly. Uh, that NPI uh, will enable early identification of the SARS CoV 2 virus in healthcare staff who don't have symptoms. And that will ensure our frontline staff can self isolate early and thereby reduce the risk of onward transmission um, of infection. Members also be aware that the testing of the asymptomatic students is also progressing at Queen's University using lateral flow devices. And the testing program has been extended to offer testing uh, where this is needed to the wider population of students. And will be the learning uh, that arises from these NTIs that will help us better understand how these new asymptomatic um, testing technologies can be implemented and, and extended, uh, extended more, more widely. Um, I've also recently asked uh, the UK government for a supply of lateral flow devices uh, and it's a sufficient calm being made available. Uh, this will enable us to do a large pilot of testing of asymptomatic people. Uh, actually they held here in Northern Ireland. Um, that pilot uh, could involve general population testing or indeed a more targeted approach involving the testing in a particular geographic location or area or indeed those at a higher risk of a symptomatic infection. Because what we, what we are you know, looking to is, is the effective use of mass testing uh, and that could be used and should be used as an additional safety net to catch at least some of the people who, who have no symptoms and who would spread the virus without knowing it. Of course, it only works if sufficient people are picked up early and if those who test positive actually isolate. Um, we continue to see that by, by protecting our care homes um, through our regular testing, this continues to be a key element of our response to this pandemic. And similarly, recognising that residents living in supported living settings are more likely to be vulnerable. I've also asked officials to prioritise uh, the provision of routine, routine testing for supported living accommodation as well. Um, and again, I'm ple pleased to report that some recent developments in respect of contact tracing service, again, with the, the number of digital enhancements, which includes the introduction of the new self-trace platform, 
Montel Hill, and other aspects of our stuff COVID-19 app. Performance figures from, the, from, from our system still remain positive in terms of reaching both index cases and, and contacts of cases. And importantly, the PHA has also commenced enhanced uh, contact tracing as well, and that started on the 16th of, of last month. This in itself is a significant development in the approach to combating the virus and will ensure a strong focus uh, on identifying the likely source of, of cases of infection and on identifying potential common exposures which lead to clusters. And I'm, I'm confident that the contact tracing service is actually well positioned uh, to deal with the pandemic and the common moments because whilst we're undoubtedly one of the challenges in early October, it was challenged in early October, I'm assured the PHA have the planning in place to allow that rapid scaling up of operations in response to any any upsurge in new case numbers. Finally, Chair, and perhaps more importantly for today, and I, I welcome your your, um, uh, your I, I, I welcome your willingness to you know, invite Patricia along here today to give us an update on, on, on the vaccine program because members will be aware um, of the important announcement yesterday. For the first time in a very long time, uh, we can have real grounds for, for optimism. The Pfizer vaccine has been found to be effective. It's being rapidly produced as we speak and is likely being prepared for dispatch to Northern Ireland. And as part of, of that four UK nation approach, I expect that this will be followed up in, in the weeks, if not days ahead, uh, with the approval of other vaccines um, that have been found to be effective and by similarly have already been pre-ordered. Um, vaccination plans are at a very advanced stage. Um, Patricia Donnelly, uh, my department's vaccination lead, uh, will be happy to provide um, an overview. It's an overview that has been provided to the executive and yesterday was provided to the chair of the HSC trusts on my armed bodies. But Chair, I, I, I do want to insert a, a note, note, note of caution because realistically it will be well into next year before we complete our full vaccination programme uh, and it's essential therefore that we manage expectations and um, most importantly keep driving home the message um, that COVID is still in community circulation and our hospitals are facing uh, a very challenging month ahead. But brighter days are ahead, Chair. Uh, but before we get to them, uh, we haven't and we mustn't uh, let our guard down. So, Chair, that's my, my opening statement. Uh, if you want to continue on either with Patricia's presentation or if there's any questions at this stage. Okay, thank you, thank you okay, Minister. Thank you. We haven't been able to see you during that section, so we'll just ask broadcasting to see if, if when you're next speaking, if you if you can be brought into the spotlight. But we were able to hear you. There was, it was a small part, it was just a wee bit tricky, but I don't think we missed uh, too much that we can't. So thank you very much for that, Minister um, Briefing. Uh, thank, thank you for that briefing. Um, Patricia, I'll come to you in a, in a, in a little minute there. Um, and also just to welcome the, uh, I think I think we all very much welcome the development and the, the hope that the uh, that the potential for the vaccine brings about, um, and also the the very hard work of you and your senior team and with you today and beyond you today, and as ever the frontline staff who have been continually under pressure in relation to this virus. And I do note from the dashboard that hospitals continue to operate around 100%. So I would reiterate your message, Minister, and I think it's very appropriate that we're not out of the woods in that sense. While there is cause for optimism, there is still a real need for vigilance and for everyone to continue doing everything they can, personally and collectively, to try to stay on, on top of, su of suppression of this virus. And I also welcome your recognition that the other elements of, of dealing with any virus, but this virus in particular, around the fine test, trace, isolate, and support, are continuing to be uh, to be uh, looked into and, and developed, and we'll, we'll come back to that hopefully at a later point. But I just want to very much welcome um, the fact that this vaccine, in fact, a series of vaccines potentially, are on the horizon and and uh, imminently available, and that's welcome. And I'm sure members will have questions around that. So thank you for that. And then, if we could, maybe uh, Patricia, could you go ahead and give us your your uh, overview of the <coughs> vaccine program? Uh, thank you. Very 
much, uh, Chair, members. I'm delighted to be here this morning uh, to talk you through the arrangements we've already put in place and what we've planned for the immediate future now that we actually think we're going to have some vaccine to deploy. Um, the next slide. I'm not controlling the slides. Thank you. Um, this is the structure for the implementation group. We have an oversight board, which is chaired by the CMO um, and would have met uh, regularly, but in the last uh, number of weeks, now it's weekly with us. Sorry, I try Patricia, the implementation. Patric Patricia, sorry to cut across you. It's a wee bit hard to hear you there. I wonder, can you move a little closer <laughs> or do you have a headset, which sometimes is easier, or easier for us to hear? Sure. I've moved closer. Uh, is, has that improved the sound? A little, although it's still a, a wee bit hard to just. Very if, yeah. Can broadcasting can broadcasting turn the sound up in the room slightly as well? And we. Uh, yep. Yeah. So. Chair, I notice members also have their microphones on. That might help if we switched off uh, or turned down uh, those or those that are joining online. Perhaps could switch off their uh, go on to mute by not speaking. Yeah, that's 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 actually good advice, and and certainly that if all other people online there could mute their systems in the room here, the microphones are live, I believe, all the time. But if other members online could mute their system, that that should help. So listen, we'll try that again, Patricia. If you could, if you could go ahead again and, and uh, resume where you were, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I do hope you can hear me more clearly. Um, this is the. Uh, Implementation Programme Board, uh, as I said, the Oversight Board is chaired by CMO, uh, meeting weekly, and I chair the Implementation Group and I'm a report to the Oversight Board. And we have uh, a number of work streams that have been very busy um, over the last number of weeks and uh, particularly busy over the last number of days, the closer it gets uh, to receiving the vaccine. There's a pharmacy group that focuses on the receipt, the distribution, all the medicines governance around this. You will know that uh, the Pfizer vaccine now has MHRA approval, um, but there are conditions attached to the approval um, to make it safe to deploy. And so pharmacy are writing up a lot of the uh, operating procedures for that and looking at how we can distribute this and use it safely. Um, we have a logistics group that have uh, many parts to it because our plan is to have three main um, arms to the uh, programme. Uh, we have a staff um, vaccination program, which you've probably heard a lot about in the last uh, uh, 24 hours. Um, we have a care home uh, program, which will have mobile teams uh, going out into care homes. And we have a primary care program, which will be run in conjunction with uh, general practice, where we will support them uh, to uh, vaccinate the um, older adults and those who are within the vulnerable groups. Um, so we have working across trusts, um, the PHA, uh, health board, um, our care partners, etc. So that we have a liaison group with the care home sector, and we have uh, each trust is appointed a lead director of significant experience uh, to lead their part of the program. Um, we also have a digital uh, work stream which looks at the the data capture so that we are able to book on um, uh, individuals to come for vaccination. We're able to provide surveillance and we're able to provide reporting. And they've had to build as they go. Um, some of the requirements for this have been driven by the particular characteristics of the vaccine. And that has meant that we are, it's a big ask for everyone because from the very start of this, we've tried to build something that was flexible, agile, and that we could respond quickly to whatever those demands are. And I believe we have that, um, albeit that uh, some of those demands are only recently been um, confirmed so that we know exactly what we need to do. And then there's a very importantly, a communications work stream. Uh, it, uh, we're working on a four nation basis. So some of that is led uh, from the UK, but uh, Northern Ireland will have its own um, communication strategy and it's, uh, partly a public relations around information about the vaccine, um, information about the program, and, and also tackling some of the misinformation uh, that is uh, so detrimental to people's uh, confidence in this um, important uh, vaccination program. And uh, they've done a lot of uh, 
stakeholder analysis and looking at how they would target those messages. Could we go to the next slide, please? And although yesterday we did not know exactly when the vaccines would get approval, we knew that a vaccine and a series of vaccines would get approval. Uh, we worked on the basis that the UK signed up for seven vaccines and we were aware that the first two vaccines were likely to arrive with us sometime in December and the early new year. So it made us much more um, confident about our arrangements because although we want to be flexible, the closer we get to certainty, the easier it is for us to confirm for staff and for those coming for vaccination exactly what the arrangements are. Um, we had been advised to uh, from the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation, who provide the ad advice on this, um, to, to have a, a deployment to priority groups to um, the 18 years and over. However, I'm very aware that in the last uh, 24 hours, their advice is looking like we should look at 16 years and over. When that is confirmed, well, that's exactly what we will, will do. Um, so we'll be deploying to slightly more than uh, 1.4 million. Uh, they've also advised that we estimate on a 75% uptake, which would be a very healthy uptake for any vaccination program. But we believe that in the high priority groups, it'll be higher than that. So we planned on that basis. Um, we've been working with the other nations uh, to look at uh, common principles, protocols and advice so that we're all doing the same thing so that there's fairness, there's equity uh, in how this is approached. Um, and so we're all following the JCVI ad advice um, and the Northern Ireland modelling for the phasing and the organisation was really dependent not just on the JCV advice, but also on the availability of the vaccine, the vaccine characteristics and the priority groups identified. And you will already know something about the, the vaccine characteristics. I think it's been uh, pretty well described by the media in that uh, the first vaccine that has had MHRA approval is one that has an ultra low temperature requirement. Uh, and that is not probably the most challenging aspect of that. I think it is once defrosted, it has a short shelf life of five days and we're operating on four days to make sure that we um, have a margin of safety. And uh, the most challenging aspect of it is that it comes in very large packs of 195 vials. Each vial has five doses. And if you're quick at the maths, you'll realize that's 975 doses per pack. Uh, and that being the case, we can't break down that pack other than under manufacturing licensed uh, conditions, which we do not have. Therefore, we have to deploy a whole pack at, uh, in the one location uh, uh, within a narrow time period. And we planned on that basis. Um, that has made it very difficult, I think, for everyone concerned uh, across the UK about how we would um, present that uh, vaccine to the priority groups. And we've worked through a number of scenarios and ways that we can attempt that. And uh, we'll take advice from NHRA about the conditions under which we have to operate, which may preclude, I think, some of the plans that, that uh, we have in place. Um, information is now available. Um, just recently, once the, the approval was um, again yesterday, to enable a valid process to take place. And that's what's linked to the public information campaign. And of course, we're still in a pandemic situation. So as with the winter flu, all that social distancing, PPE requirements um, apply so that we have to factor that into the way we deploy and the way we organize these clinics. And the other uh, part that we have to um, consider and plan for is that for this vaccine and the next number of vaccines coming along, it's a two dose application. Um, uh, uh, JCVI had advised us to plan on the basis of 28 days. Pfizer advises 21 days. I think there'll be some re resolved advice on this, but either way, we can we our program can plan on a three-week um, cycle um, repeated or a four-week cycle repeated. Uh, we'll work within whatever the requirements are. And as with any new vaccine, MHRA also requires a an observation period immediately after vaccination. So again, you can imagine with the challenges of uh, social distancing that the locations that people work in 
um, are not always suitable for this, as you're putting a large number of people through that have to be socially distanced. So you'll understand that when we've looked at the assessment of where this is most appropriately deployed, we've come to a narrow range of options. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. And we have a five-phased plan. Thank you. Um, I hope you can read this. It's probably the most interesting slide. I know anyone, uh, when they see it, starts to work out where they are on the on the phasing and where the people they love are on the phasing. Um, uh, on the left, you'll see these are indicative timings. Um, until we actually have received the vaccine in Oviento stores in in uh, Belfast and are certain about the supply, none of this can be confirmed. But we've planned on the basis that it would be available. We've got some indicative uh, delivery information about uh, the vaccine we will have for distribution. Um, on the right-hand side, you will see that those are the target populations. So we know the size of the populations, and this is all aligned to the JCVI advice. So our five-phase uh, program starts with the immediate high priority areas and it rolls through a series of phases um, and you can see they get bigger as we go through um, and uh, by phase four we're looking at all the people who have not been vaccinated uh, in those priority groups and then phase five we have an expectation that this this particular coronavirus will be with us for some time and that we do expect there'll be some routine vaccination program whether that's annual or biannual, or just as integrated into the flu program, really that's um, for further research and, and uh, the outcome of, of what the immunity is going to be and the length of immunity uh, from these vaccines. But if I take you back, probably this is the, the area of most concern as it's the, it's the part that we're spending most time on in the last uh, number of weeks. Um, now as we approach the implementation, and that's groups one and two. Um, it is no surprise to you that care home residents and care home staff are in the top priority group. We've seen the impact this um, uh, uh, virus has had on those populations. And when JCV advice, uh, JCV reviewed all the evidence for um, who was most at risk, they concluded that there were all kinds of uh, formulas that they could um, devise and review, but in the end, uh, being older, particularly over 80 years of age, uh, conferred the highest risk, and being living within a closed community such as a care home uh, added additional risk because of the high transmission rates in those environments. So they set them as the highest priority group, um, and then the second priority group were health and social care staff um, because of their exposure and the over 80 year olds. So those are the first groups that we are targeting and our planning is on that basis. Um, the second range of priority groups, they go down in five year tranches from over 75, over 70s down to over 65s. And again, we start to move into those who are vulnerable and extremely vulnerable. And in Northern Ireland, that's about 225,000 uh, people of which 95,000 are considered extremely vulnerable. But you will know and appreciate that many people who are in this phase two group will be anxious and have already been approaching us to say, we believe we're vulnerable, we believe we should be on phase one. We will have to be um, looking very strongly to the JCVI advice and going on those that they have assessed as being most at risk. So I think it's important that for people to be aware of where they are in the priority list, aware of the expectations um, and the timeframes. Um, we would be hoping that um, if we start immediately in December, as the vaccine becomes available with the priority of one groups in phase one, that we will roll that through um, December and January. And again, we have to do it again, whether in a three week or a four week cycle and that uh, the phase two groups as the uh, primary care start to work their way through these groups and um, that will commence in January and through February and potentially into March before we move on to the next uh, group which will move down to the over 50 year olds um, and um, 
over 60 year olds again in, in tranches. And uh, by the time we get to the remaining group, this is where we think probably in phase four, we will have the lowest level of uptake because these are individuals who will not be concerned potentially about their own risk of coronavirus. Therefore, they um, may have a lower motivation, but we do expect a very robust uptake. Um, so we know who we have to vaccinate. Could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. OK, we know who we have to vaccinate and we've looked at the vaccinators um, and we started a campaign in November uh, that went out through the health service workforce appeal. Um, I think you've got some information on the screen that and when I briefed the executive um, last week, I said 600 expressions of interest and 400 applications that has risen to nearly a thousand expressions of interest and over 700 applications. And these are people that aren't currently within the workforce um, or at least not working within the, any vaccination program. And uh, so we're very heartened by that um, important response. So they're all in the process of being appointed and been trained. And this weekend we have a major webinar um, session with them to prepare them for what's ahead. Um, but there, it takes time to train a vaccinator. You may think it's a straightforward thing, but there's, there's important... Um, uh, medicines governance uh, and uh, care uh, information that they need uh, to do this. And there's also a piece that they need to do that's specific to the vaccine. So in the first instance, we're going for our good to go vaccinators. And these are the 880 people who are peer vaccinators already trained within trusts. So that's who we look to and they're available um, to support us. And others have stepped forward like dentists and dental staff. They've offered us uh, those staff, which again, are very appropriate. So we believe we've got approval of the vaccine. We now have uh, a, a workforce that are available more than, um, more than capable of delivering the program. What we rely now is on the vaccine actually coming. So we have some indicative um, delivery schedules, but because there's no certainty about the future, we have to be cautious about it. So uh, today I'm in a very unusual situation. I'm meeting with trusts later today and I will be starting to try and match w their plans, which are ambitious and uh, to, to move forward on this vaccination program. And I'm going to have to rein those back very slightly to match that to the available vaccine that we, we believe that we're going to have across December and January. But uh, the closer it gets to having the vaccine, the more confident we can be about um, how quickly we can get this program expedited. Uh, the last slide, please. And underpinning is going to be the important uh, communication plan. And as I uh, indicated earlier, this is led nationally, but we will have a targeted local um, campaign around this. And I think th that's going to be terribly important that we have clear messaging um, about the safety of the, the vaccine, the availability of it, and when people are likely uh, to be vaccinated. Um, so we do believe we can um, deliver a robust uh, program and we think it's flexible enough to be able to pick up all the, the um, different issues that I think MHRA and JCVI are going to require of us. And uh, we hope it matches yours and the public's expectations. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Patricia, and uh, that's, a, that's a very, very useful presentation, I have to say, and I think, I think members will welcome that. Um, I suppose just a couple of questions from myself. First of all, in terms of towards the end there, Patricia, you were, you were telling us about the, what had been 880, or you need, you need 880 peer vaccinators and other staff, um, and that you've had significant um, applications and expressions of interest, which is very welcome. Now, I know you said that currently not in workforce or not in the vaccination programme. So I'm wondering what your assessment is of the potential impact on other services. And we're acutely aware that community and acute services are under some pressure as it is. And, and in, that, in that light, what procedures are in place to try to ensure that volunteers coming into the vaccination programme don't take a core staff from other services and, and create additional pressure there. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, well, we've worked closely with trusts 
there, those 880 peer vaccinators already exist. They're already working within trusts. What trusts have also told us that they have other staff um, who are stepping forward to either backfill those positions or to come forward as additional vaccinators. So we know that for each of the staff mass vaccination centres that we have uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 vaccinators working each day on an 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, to, to work through. So we're trying to minimise the impact of, of that on services. So we've been careful about that, mindful that this is the winter, mindful that this is the time when, particularly for acute services, they come most under pressure. So as I said, we're working very closely with those directors. Often they have laid roles around that, those winter pressure management. Thank you. And my second question then is probably more for the Minister or maybe the Chief Medical Officer, whichever of you or, or both of you if, you, if you like. But I suppose there has been, you know, uh, in, in, in the public domain, um, people, are, people are saying, you know, first of all, welcoming how quickly this was managed to be done, but also people saying, you know, how then has, the, has this been brought forward in a way that is not only effective, which seems to be the case, and safe, but would you want to take an opportunity just to set out some of those uh, procedures that have been gone through to uh, allay any any outstanding concern there might be in relation I'm to? Yeah. Maybe, maybe come in first. I don't know if the, the camera's picking up now, but hopefully. Yeah, right. okay. we're seeing, we're seeing um, the minister, yeah. That's, that's a good side you're getting this morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, Colin, Colin, your point is valid, and it is something which we, we, we have said and something we've actually struggled with since the outbreak of, of, of the pandemic. Um, this is the first pandemic we've had to fight side by side with social media, and that's where the easy challenge uh, function comes from, often from people who, who are using social media anonymous, anonymously and using uh, data and all kinds um, reasons and rationales about why they wouldn't take the vaccine or nobody else should. What we will say uh, in regards to this, and I'm sure Michael or Patricia can pick up on the specifics, uh, MRHA have deemed this vaccine safe to use. Um, a, a group of um, highly professionalised medics, scientists uh, across the board who wouldn't be signing off on this if they did not believe uh, the science and the accreditation uh, that was given behind it. There, there has been challenges in, in regards to how this vaccine came about so quickly. Uh, and reading, you know, reading other papers in, in regards to production of vaccines or even medications, um, this process has not been short-circuited. One of the things that has been is heavily invested in from the very beginning, rather than whoever is producing a medication or a vaccine, having to go to seek funding and convincing funders of the need of the medication or actually getting it to market. Whereas the demand for this vaccine actually led uh, and was in, in, in front of um, the, the production and the, the design of it. So look, look, we actually saw production lines being put in place before the vaccine was produced. And we've seen you know, the UK government has pre-bought seven vaccines uh, before, you know, through that process, so I, I can give the assurance, you know, that it's coming from MRHA that we stand over as well. You know, unless this vaccine was deemed uh, to be safe and be suitable, um, we would not be using it. And I think as Patricia highlights there as well, you know, while we wait on a lot of the clarification that comes about the utilisation of this vaccine and where it can be used, and that's the restrictions that are being put on uh, its use by MRHA that we will follow because we cannot and we will not uh, deviate from the advice and guidance that they are given because that would undermine the effectiveness and the efficacy uh, either of the vaccine or the supply chain itself. So when it comes to, you know, this is common as, as Patricia said, 975 packed doses being stored at minus 70 to minus 80, uh, shelf life of five days, that's all the guidance and the instruction that we have to follow to the letter for this to be delivered uh, efficiently and safely as well. So in regards to the process of, of certification, Michael, I don't know if you or, or Patricia want to pick up on, on further detail. Uh, Minister, I'm just very happy to do this because I think, Chair, it's a very important issue. Um, and you know the fact that we have developed a vaccine that is both safe and effective uh, in 10 months 
in a, for a novel virus that, and a process that would normally take t- 10 years. Uh, the MHRA is recognised globally uh, for its high standards of safety, quality and effectiveness before recommending the use of any uh, vaccine uh, for human uh, use. And I think it's important to state that at the outset. Uh, the MHRA has always stated that the safety of the public is its foremost uh, concern. Uh, I think that if we uh, maybe explain a little bit about the process, that, that might be helpful to members and indeed for, for those who are viewing and listening. Um, the decision of the uh, MHRA was based on independent advice from the some of the highest and best scientists uh, in the UK uh, who are members of the uh, Commission on Human Medicines. So that uh, committee of scientists and other experts provides independent advice, independent uh, of government uh, to the MHRA. And there's been a dedicated team of MHRA scientists, clinicians uh, who've carried out a rigorous uh, scientific and detailed review of all of the available data starting back in October. And that's a process that's known as a, a rolling review and it's applied when uh, we're in a public health emergency, which we are, uh, and when there's a promising new medicine uh, or new vaccine. So that without uh, cutting corners uh, or short circuiting any of the processes, that new medicine or that new vaccine uh, can be put to use as soon as, as possible. Um, the MHRA experts looked at all of the data. They looked at all of the preclinical data, uh, the laboratory uh, studies and data. They looked at all of the clinical trial data on an ongoing basis as that data became uh, available. Um, and uh, they looked at the manufacturing processes, the quality control, uh, the sampling and testing of the final vaccine. That was done on an ongoing basis. Uh, so what I can say to, to everyone is uh, the MHRA have made an independent recommendation on the safety and uh, effectiveness of of this vaccine. As the minister has said, it's now over to us uh, to ensure that we make this this vaccine available to the public, uh, so that we could begin to protect the, the most vulnerable. Thank you. So I'll go I'll go to members now. I'll start off with our deputy chair Pam Cameron, and then I'll go to Paula Jonathan. I'll come to Colin on the phone then after Jonathan, and then I'll come back into the room. So Pam, please. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Minister CMO, and um, a very special welcome. I think to Patricia Donnelly. I think you're probably the most popular person in Northern Ireland <laughs> now, uh, certainly for me. Um, and I, I just want to say from the outset that, uh, Minister, I completely agree with you. I think it's not a time for complacency. I think that's really, really important um, that we all still adhere to all the measures and whatever rules and regulation will be in place until we, we truly get um, to probably next summer, let's face it. Um, but I think it is incredibly important that we give people hope. And I think that's what we now have. And it's really important that we, we do have that hope and that um, that should really give us, uh, give our mental health certainly a lift. Um, so I think that's good to be looking forward to, to better days. In terms of um, questions, um, I, I would be interested to learn how the 75% uptake figure has been established. Um, it does seem ambitious, which is not a bad thing, um, but it does highlight the need for a successful information campaign to debunk the myths and reservations that you, that you will be facing. Um, and it's important that we do cut off the roots, I think, of those in, in society who believe a vaccination will be coupled with an approach to uh, a civil life and economy which will discriminate against those without a vaccine. Uh, I think these arguments do need to be addressed early and effectively. So really, my, my questions are um, around the 75% figure uh, for the uptake of the, of the um, COVID vaccine. How has that been devised? Is that a national figure? Is it a target rather than a minimum requirement um, for herd immunity? And, and then the second part of that would be around how you will be tackling that misinformation, and how that will be countered, and what does a valid consent process entail? Um, thanks, Brad. I'm going to pick up just, just in, on, on your first point. That it, it is crucial that we don't um, lose or abuse the potential that this vaccine actually brings. Um, it will take weeks and months before we see the real benefit of it. That's why the current restrictions that we have in place, that's why all that guidance that we have in place, you know, good hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, social distancing, face coverings, 
reduce your number of contacts is all still very, very important because we do still have to get into next year and well into next year before we'll see the benefits of, of this vaccine actually rolling out. Um, so that's why, you know, I, I would I go and, uh, and support that message. You know, we can't afford to, to, to lose the opportunity that we now have in front of us or abuse the hope that this, uh, this vaccine actually, actually brings. Uh, in regards to, to your point, uh, in regard to linking um, the uptake of the vaccine to some sort of access to to, to recreation or, or even getting into economic or econ um, retail settings, things like that, it is not the intention, nor will it be the policy intention um, of either my department or the executive. I had the conversation with the first and deputy first minister yesterday because it's not the way it's not normal for, for it's not normal for people in Northern Ireland to, to, to require that. But what I would say, we, we would have no control or influence over those uh, international companies. I think there's actually a significant airline uh, who are now indicating that um, pre identification or pre certification that you've had the vaccine will be a will be a condition to fly on now, whether that's taken up by others outside or remit or or, or jurisdiction. But it's not something that we'll be taking forward um, as any sort of of policy intent. In regards to to the percentage uptake, you know, Patricia and Michael can come in on, on the specifics of those. But you know, it is around what we set our target this year for flu vaccine uptake as well, which in many sectors and many scenarios we're actually hitting um, well before what would have been our, our usual uptake or our usual targets as well. So. Um, the 75% does, uh, you know, is greater immunity in the community, uh, where we can see the benefit of a large uptake of a of a vaccine. So, and Michael or Patricia on, on those points. Yeah, uh, uh, Minister, happy to, to pick it up in the first instance. I think the a very, very good question, um, 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 and thank you for it. I mean, I think the aim or the target of 75% uh, sort of is really indicative of our experience from previous. Uh, vaccine programs with extensive experience in, in the health service of uh, hundreds of thousands of vaccines being administered each and every year as part of our childhood immunization program as part of our seasonal flu vaccine these you know this is part of our uh, everyday work uh, we have extensive uh, and very capable arrangements in general practice as Patricia alluded to earlier in pharmacy in occupational health uh, our school nurse teams etc. Uh, so we have a very, very effective mechanism for delivering uh, vaccines, and our experience has generally been uh, to aim for uh, at as many people in the population as possible to have the maximum benefit. Uh, you mentioned population immunity, um, and it is important that also, in addition to vaccinating the most vulnerable, that we get high population uptake when we get into those later phases of the program that Patricia uh, talked about, uh, because that's the best way of protecting everyone, including the vulnerable. Yes, the vaccine protects the vulnerable, but also us uh, who are perhaps less vulnerable, less at risk by availing of the vaccine when it's our turn, also help protect uh, the vulnerable like, the levels of community circulation of, of uh, the virus as, as low uh, as, as possible. Um, certainly what we want to achieve is at least over 50% uh, of uh, the population uh, being vaccinated. And certainly if we can get that up to 70, 75 percent, that actually will be a very, very significant achievement. Uh, the point you made about vaccine hesitancy uh, is a very important one. Um, I think that, as Patricia said in her uh, presentation, the importance of addressing uh, and informing any concerns or anxieties that there are, and the opportunity this morning to come and explain to uh, the committee uh, and addressing those issues about the regulatory approval processes, the extensive research, uh, the evidence that we have looked at, that is all vitally important in reassuring the public, not just about how effective the virus or the vaccine is, but also uh, how safe it is. Uh, Patricia, sorry, I'll stop there and, and pass over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. If I perhaps pick up the last issue, which is a valid uh, consent process, uh, it's a, an important issue and of course for consent to be valid it has to be informed so the information we are now receiving um, from Pfizer from uh, MHRA and uh, allows us to provide information that will go out both in the through the public information campaigns but for those who have been invited 
uh, to step forward for the vaccination. So if they accept the appointment, that is a presumed consent at that point, which it would be normal for any vaccination program, but the information they would be provided in advance and on the day will inform that. And for those who do not have the capacity to consent, uh, those who are responsible for them, whether they're in care homes or their uh, GPs, etc., have the responsibility to act in their best interests. And they'll weigh that up about what their personal risk is from this virus against any potential risks, uh, which from this low risk uh, vaccination. So I think unlike many other uh, best interest cases that have to be decided, this is a much more straightforward one, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. And members, I'm, I'm very conscious we've had a, wel a very welcome and a very detailed presentation. It has eaten into our time a little bit, so could I maybe suggest we do a quick round of questions on vaccines? If a member's question has already been asked but you don't have a or you have a different question, if you want to indicate that, I'll pass and I'll come back to you for hopefully if we get time for any other questions. Um, so, and I could just ask members and, uh, and, and the panel to be as succinct and brief with the question and answers as possible, so we get as much in. Yep. All questions to start then? Yep, okay. go ahead. Um, thank you very much, and Patricia, a special welcome to you this morning. My question relates to the issue of the um, JCVI. They have excluded a recommendation for under-16s who live with special educational needs or serious underlying health conditions. They've excluded them, and I, I appreciate you said you were following their advice in terms of those most clinically at risk. The, the parents who have been caring for them for 10 months, their, palp their anxiety is palpable. They no longer have the shielding letters. So I'm just wondering, is there um, a way that um, you can be looking beyond just the clinical risk, but then to think about the impact on the family and the, the mental health of that family if they are excluded until later stages to get the vaccine. Thank you. Uh, I, I think JCV advice is what has been given at this moment in time. I believe that they will refine this as the experience of using the vaccine um, is uh, deployed. So I do think this may be revisited at some point. Um, I don't think we've got the capacity to revisit that because you're going to make some very fine judgments about who is at risk and what that potential impact is. So I think uh, our oversight group and, and uh, the, the um, agreement that we've signed up to with the four nations has said that we would stick with that advice. But I fully appreciate the anxiety there is for those individuals, for families uh, living um, with anyone who has an underlying condition. But uh, it, depending on the, the kind of thresholds, they may well fall into one of the vulnerable groups um, uh, as individuals. So they may not be excluded on the basis of age. It will only be on the basis of, um, I think, uh, where they, their risk is low. Thank you. Jonathan. Thank you, and good morning, Minister, CMO and Mrs Donnelly. On the, on the 5th of November, the Minister and the CMO told the Committee that there were 220 contact tracers employed in Northern Ireland and that rapid testing was in pilot and validation stage. Uh, can the Minister give us an update on the numbers involved now, four weeks later, in contact tracing? And can the CMO give us the update on rapid testing and how many of the four million lateral flow tests have been received in Northern Ireland? Um, okay, I, I thought we were dealing with vaccine questions, but just give me a minute, Jonathan. I'll, I'll right. get that. I'll get that brief. Um, we currently have 269 staff uh, available in contact tracing, and again, those work over the three different contract deployments that, that we currently have, and that's uh, full time, part time, um, bank staff. Uh, to to do uh, as a conversation I had with the chair, if we were to utilise all those staff um, to a full time equivalent, it reaches in regards to two hundred full full time uh, employees, and that's that that's what we have a, 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 at this point in time. But we continue that ongoing uh, recruitment campaign. In regards to the lateral flow devices, I know in my opening statement um, I referred to where we'd already started to use uh, some some of that technology. Uh, in regards to the pilot that we had in Queens um, for for our students there to allow them to go home and to, to support those those who want to return home and those families as well. We're about to run out one on lunch, uh, asymptomatic uh, testing for healthcare workers. Uh, that's due to, to commence shortly. 
in that, as I said, Newton's statement enables that early identification of the virus in healthcare staff who don't have the symptoms and assure frontline staff can self-isolate early. Um, we're also looking at a number of workplace settings uh, and other educational and community settings as well for an early early, early pilot or, or NTIs as, we, as, as we're for referring to them, but as they're being referred to across, across the country, and that's new testing interventions. So, Michael, I don't know if you want to pick up specifically on that point. Uh, no, Minister, I think you've largely covered the issues in terms of the numbers utilised today. I don't have the, those figures in front of me, uh, but certainly happy to provide uh, those uh, to, to the member. I think it's important to, to point out these are new technologies, um, and therefore these tests, as I've said before, the committee require uh, stringent validation, and we do compare the test results against the, the gold standard, the PCR test, which we're all uh, now familiar with. So we are deploying in Northern Ireland uh, a range of new technologies, the lab uh, technology, which again, uh, we would in particular minister alluded to, we're rolling out in our health trusts for regular testing of health and social care workers following validation and following putting in place all those operational arrangements. Uh, so that is uh, underway, as the minister said. We're particularly fortunate that Queen's University has extensive experience in the lamp optogene test, uh, which uh, we are abusing. Uh, the Innova uh, lateral flow devices, uh, again, which are, have also been previously referred to, to a pregnancy test, again, don't involve uh, laboratories. Uh, we are currently using those, uh, again, uh, around uh, our universities in terms of testing uh, the students prior to test for students uh, prior to returning home over the Christmas period. Uh, we have also plans to use those on a pilot basis uh, within a number of school settings. Uh, including a special school, um, and uh, as Minister has indicated, we are uh, have established a, a joint programme, which is meeting actually later today, uh, which I will be chairing uh, between uh, Queen's University, uh, the Expert Advisory uh, Consortium, and the Academic Partnership, which uh, is uh, with a number of academic institutes uh, and commercial uh, partners, including uh, Almark, um, etc. Uh, to outline the approach and agree the pros which we propose to the minister in terms of how we would use targeted home community testing. And this is a, a program which would seek to identify asymptomatic carriage of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus in individuals perhaps who are repeatedly exposed to the virus. And we will also be considering options uh, using a uh, targeted approach to perhaps uh, those areas or local communities where we have a higher prevalence. But what I would say to the member is that uh, these new technologies need to be used at a standardised and controlled way once they are validated. Uh, they are not a panacea, uh, and I would want to just be uh, advise the committee that um, you know we have tried and tested mechanisms in place to control this virus. They are working. We need to stick with those, particularly uh, as. Uh, the chair has reminded us that we temper uh, our approach at present by the hope and optimism that is associated with the, the vaccine rollout. Sorry, apologies, Chair, I've gone on a little bit there. Okay. Thank you, uh, and, and thank you, Minister. I had indicated that I was taking a quick round on, on vaccines, um, but I appreciate the Minister answering that, and we'll go ahead. I want to give everyone a chance to get a question in the vaccines when we have Patricia here. So I'll go on then to Colin on the phone. And Colin, just, 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 just yeah, to indicate, Colin, if you don't, Colin, if you don't have a question on the vaccine, I will come back to you. If you have a question on something else, I will come back to anyone who indicates that. I'll come back to them first. So if it's on the vaccine, okay. go ahead. And if not, we'll come back to you. Okay. Yes, sir. On the vaccine and yeah. very, hard, very, hard to hear, very hard to hear you, Colin, if you can just uh, come closer to the phone. If I get any closer to the screen, uh, sir, it's very unnatural. So I think I'll just try, hopefully, and... <laughs> Well, then, uh, well, then, you're better now, anyway. Whatever you have done um, has worked. Go ahead. Oh, thanks very much. I just wanted to echo the Deputy Chair's remarks about the special welcome to Patricia and obviously the work that she will be heading up. But also to say it's always a welcome to have the Minister and the Chief Medical Officer here as well. We wouldn't want the, to leave them out in the welcome. But in terms of the, the vaccine, I, I, know I may have missed this in, in some of the information that's been presented. But if people get um, the vaccination, does that stop them having the capacity to spread the virus? Um, or does that just vaccinate them against receiving it? And if that was the case, 
do we see the potential as people are vaccinated alongside this for there to be a loosening of the restrictions? And I'm thinking particularly if we have care home staff and uh, residents um, vaccinated, say, just by Christmas time or early January, does that mean that we could look towards visitations happening within that setting quicker? Or will it have to wait until everybody is vaccinated before that type of regulation could be lifted? Um, thanks, Colin. No, I, I, in, in regards to your point, it's still something that, that, that the logistics of of what that means is still being worked through. Because I think, Chair, and maybe just take this opportunity to, to put in as well that we should emphasise that this is the first batch of the first vaccine. So we're not at the point of of mass vaccination yet. So we need to be we need to be cautious on on that point as well. This this is the start of a. Of a, of a long campaign, of a, of a long piece of work. So all those, all those other scenarios get, get worked through at the same time. Specifically in regards to, to your other questions and, and, and the shedding of vaccine and whether it can still be, still be contagious with COVID even after receiving the vaccine. I'll let Michael or, or Patricia pick, pick up on that as well. But in regards to the easing of restrictions and, and the point where we get to not needing restrictions. Our regulations call nuts well into well into next year before we can get there uh, with any degree of comfort. Uh, but there will be uh, certain areas we can lift the, those those restrictions on. And I think we, even when you look at the prioritisation of the phasing of the vaccines, would nearly give an indication of where we will see some relaxations of what we currently have in place. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, uh, Colin. Just very briefly before I pass across to um, Patricia, the very important question uh, in, in relation to the uh, differential between prevention of disease and the prevention of infectiousness. About the vaccine, the, the vaccine is not a live vaccine. So the issue of shedding of uh, virus from people vaccinated is not an issue or not a concern. And that, that's really important point. Uh, what we do know is that this vaccine is 90% 95% effective in preventing disease. What we don't yet have, however, is robust data that would allow us to conclude that it prevents infectiousness. Uh, I think it's highly likely uh, that that's the case, but that's speculation on my part, and we really need to await the evidence on that, because if that is also the case, then it does begin uh, to give us more confidence that the relaxation and measures that we've currently sadly uh, becoming to know and live with would be increasingly a thing of the past. Trisha, I don't know if you want to add to any of that. We're not Apologies. Here, Patricia. Uh, um, one final comment, which is uh, uh, CMO has mentioned the, the bit about prevention of, of the infection itself, and you've been discussing transmission. The third element is for those who are outside the 95% who do catch COVID, I think there's some emerging evidence that they will have a lesser impact. So if you do, if you're on lucky enough to catch it, it will have a lesser impact. So Thank you. three elements. Thank you, Patricia. Jerry. And that vaccine, Chair. Okay, I'll come back to you, Jerry. Thank you. Um, Alan. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, just a couple of quick logistic uh, questions. We, we told her about the, the, the boxes were 195. Uh, vaccinations in them, uh, and they've been delivered. Uh, they're having to be kept at quite a low temperature. Um, once they, that box is open, uh, can it, it's five days. It has to be used. Does it have to be stored at those low temperatures, or is it just? Uh, can you operate with it just at ambient temperature? Uh, under 18s, not getting vaccinated, but would we see a situation where uh, this a vaccine for this virus? Is going to be ongoing. In other words, once young people come into adulthood in future years, uh, will there be uh, will it be a routine to get a COVID uh, vaccination? And the other uh, last point is just the, uh, a lot of the younger population maybe feel that it's not going to it's not going to have a great effect in, on them if they do get this virus. But we know about the long COVID. Uh, and the debilitating, debilitating effects it's having on, on people. But also, the, there seems to be some information coming forward that young people who are getting over recovering are actually developing heart issues. Uh, can we confirm, is, is, that, is there evidence that that is happening? Yeah, back to our panel there, please. 
Minister, I don't know if the Minister's still on the line. Do, do you want me to? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure I may have lost, Minister. Maybe I could pick up on uh, some aspects of that. Uh, as, uh, as Patricia indicated uh, in relation to her presentation, phase five uh, of the rollout of the vaccine, we do anticipate that there will be a requirement uh, for ongoing vaccination uh, of the population. I, you know, as we've said before, I, we don't believe this is a virus that's going to go away. Um, however, we do anticipate as a virus we can get back under control, uh, but it will remain with us. Uh, and we most probably at a population level will require seasonal uh, boosters or indeed maybe biannual uh, further uh, vaccinations to maintain immunity. So in relation to people uh, and children, you know, young people growing up and, and uh, into adulthood, yes, uh, I think that's highly likely that we will need to vaccinate. Uh, those uh, now younger people as they as they age to uh, afford the protection. In terms of the questions around um, long COVID, I think it's really important that uh, we make again the point that this is not uh, a virus uh, to be uh, taken lightly. Uh, we know the significant impact it's had in terms of mortality, uh, complications. We also know that there are cardiovascular complications with this virus uh, as part of the, the long COVID uh, syndrome, neurological complications, a very significant uh, number of complications are emerging, uh, including uh, myocardial heart uh, complications. And that is something which is kept under active review uh, and uh, research. So we cannot trivialize this virus uh, and we do need to take uh, it seriously. Trisha, can I hand you across to you just in terms of the logistical issues around storage of vaccine and packs? Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you for the question. Um, uh, uh, to be clear, that in the frozen state, the Pfizer vaccine can be stored for five to six months. But once it's defrosted from the dry ice conditions, um, which it's transported in, you've got five days, and it's five days within a fridge. So it's a two to eight degrees, which is the way normal vaccines are stored. So at that point, it becomes more manageable. Um, and the vaccines that are coming next, I think, will be stored ex in exactly those conditions from two to eight degrees in refrigerated conditions. But once it's taken out in ambient conditions within a clinic, uh, it can only be used for up to eight hours. And after that, it is ineffective and it can't be returned to the cold chain. OK, thank you. So I'm going then to Orlea. Yes, um, thank you. I'm not sure if the minister is still with us, but thanks minister, to Michael and, and Patricia. The minister um, appears to have dropped off at the present time, so we're trying to get him back on the line. I'll go ahead with my two very quick questions. So my first question is around, um, it's been mentioned already, around managing the expectations of the five phases that we need to, we need to follow. So how soon can the public information campaign um, commence? And I'm hoping that will be in the form of you know, the TV and the radio ads, some of the powerful ones that we've seen previously. So how soon can that, um, can that process start? And my second question is around um, the, the workforce and the, the role that community um, pharmacy could play in helping to deliver um, the vaccines because I know Patricia you have mentioned the 880 within the trusts and obviously that might have a knock-on impact on services but the community pharmacists I'm assuming wouldn't have to go through maybe that process of training that the 700 um, applicants um, to the workforce appeal might have to go through so is there conversations with community pharmacy and helping roll it out in, in one of the future phases thank you for a short time um, but by um, no just in, in regards to or Leah's point on that information that will be starting shortly we do, because we do have to make sure uh, people understand where they come in that prioritization so that there isn't frustration or anger in regards to to when people come, come come forward and that's why i want to stress again the point that i did make earlier chair this is the first batch of the first vaccine um, so we are working with, with a reduced number, but it allows us to get our, our processes into place as to, to who will receive it and when we'll receive it. So there is quite a, there's a piece of comms work um, already being put in place. Uh, it was covered in Patricia's slide, which maybe she can, she can touch on. But in regards to uh, engagement with community pharmacy, uh, again, this vaccine wouldn't lend itself to it. Others will. 
Uh, so Patricia can, I think, provide some detail uh, in those engagements as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, going, going to Pat then on the phone, Pat, a question on vaccines. Uh, just checking, are you there, Pat? Are you able to? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Now, I think. You hear me? Yes, go ahead, Pat. We're hearing you now. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say, like the vast majority of people, I'm sure, I welcome the advent of this vaccine and look forward to more being approved in the near future. Uh, and if everything is ruled out, as has been articulated by Patricia this morning, I mean, I'd be the first to offer congratulations. Having said that, I do have some concerns. First of all, uh, we're dependent uh, largely on the British government to supply these vaccines to us and their performance in every aspect of this, of this uh, pandemic to date has been woeful. There's also been uh, inconsistency of messaging and communication to this committee in regard to, for example, the contact tracing operation and uh, assurances that were given earlier in the year about numbers that would be involved and so on turned out not to be accurate. And there have also been problems with the rollout of the flu vaccine this year. So could uh, any of you explain to me why we should have confidence in what we're being told this morning? Thanks. Um, thanks, Pat. And I think one of the you know, thanks for your word, the advent of this, this vaccine, you know, very timely. Very seasonable as well. Saying we're into the, the Advent season, coming into Christmas as well. So I don't know if that was deliberate or not, but you know, well, 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 well played. Because you know, I, I think it is the message. You know, look, that, that's not be, that, that's not, or, or let's be, be cautious that we don't undermine the, the message that this this vaccine actually does bring. You know, there ha, there have been problems we've articulated, we've discussed them, we've discussed them across this committee, we've discussed them in, in the floor of the chamber. In regards to contact tracing and the numbers that are there, we've worked. We have worked over the last number of months uh, to bring forward digitalisation, to bring forward uh, the number of contact tracers that we have as well. In regards to how that whole system operates, so I know you refer back to you know the the, the numbers that were given that them were correct at a later at, at a later date, and I think that was apologised for and explained. And I hope you you take that in the in the system and, and, this, and uh, the sentiment that, uh, that it was meant that it was a, a mistake that was then 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 rectified. You know, we're now we're now working. You know, at uh, the contact tracing, tracing system that between and up to the period of the of the twenty eighth of November, um, actually was contacted eighty eight percent of its contacts within the first twenty four hours and ninety six within the, the forty eight hours. So at any measure on any international scale, that's that's hitting the targets that contact tracing should be done, and we're actually over and above that. In regards to the flu vaccine, um, you know, we were clear. We we got our initial batch over six hundred and sixty odd thousand, which is our normal uh, flu vaccines for for a year. We deployed that in the first twenty six days. Uh, what we actually had done at that point was was a lot of the trial, a lot of the the work that how we could actually deploy. Uh, the COVID vaccine, so it actually showed us uh, that working with our partners in primary care, community pharmacy, uh, when it came to having a vaccine that could be deployed uh, in their settings, utilising their skills, that we could uh, deploy a large-scale vaccination programme very quickly, very effectively. Maybe what we did in the flu vaccine was was actually we did too well in the first few days where we got a larger volume out uh, before our second batches have arrived, you know, so we have additional flu vaccine, and I, I got additional flu vaccine. I was able to pick up an extra fifteen thousand um, flu vaccines, the optives for the over seventy, over sixty fives from the British government. Uh, so they were able to give us that additional supply as well. Um, being part of the UK forward buying part has allowed us to be part of of that greater purchase part that has actually allowed us to pre buy uh, seven different vaccines. Uh, so they will be ready, they will be available to us um, at the Northern Ireland level uh, on a Barnet consequential. It's one of the things, uh, and I know when, when you talk about the British government, this is actually four health ministers from all jurisdictions working together, uh, supported and working to JCVI, MRHA. So it's, uh, it's a Scottish Nationalist Health Minister, it's a Welsh Labour Health Minister, it's an Ulster Unionist Northern Ireland Health Minister uh, and a Tory. Uh, English Health Minister who are working together to bring forward 
uh, this vaccination programme. And I think and I hope with what you have saw this morning and Patricia's presentation in regards to, to the work that already has been done, that it gives you the reassurance that we've put all our best efforts to make sure when these vaccines come available, we will get them out to people as quickly as we possibly can. And we'll, I, I don't know, Pat, where you fall into the, any of those phasings. Uh, I wouldn't want to make any prejudgments. Uh, but we'll, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll make sure you get access to it when you're eligible. Thank you, Minister. Okay, and I'm going back now. Finally, I'm going back now finally to Jerry for Jerry's question. Go thanks, ahead. thanks, sure. Thanks, Minister. Um, Minister, uh, myself and Paul, I met with uh, ICU uh, nurses this week, um, and they're really at breaking point. They're really stressed. Um, they're being told by their GEPs that they have to take time off work and they can't. Um, they're issuing last rights to patients, phone and families. Uh, they're being they're doing the work of band six workers, um, but being paid a band five wage. And there's a long list of, of issues, Minister. Um, they've expressed to me that they don't feel that their concerns uh, are being heard or understood by chief executives um, and the sort of uh, ministerial uh, positions and the upper echelons of the department. I just wanted to know whether the minister is aware of the scale of, of problems facing ICU nurses and what he uh, intends to do to, to try and address them. Um, thanks, Jerry. And, and look, um, to, to say that the stresses and the strains of ICU nurses or any of our workforce uh, isn't felt at the upper echelons of, of my department or even at my level, I, I think it's an understatement. I'm fully aware. Um, of the stresses and strains that, that they're currently under. Um, our chief nursing officer is doing a specific piece of work in regards to a, 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 bonding, a, a bonding issue around band five to band six, um, and nurses and, and staff and ICUs are aware of that, trusts are aware of that piece of, of work ongoing uh, as well in regards to them not being able or allowed to take time off work. If any of our staff need time off work, uh, through to stress, strains, or health reasons, they're entitled to it. Nobody will keep them or force them uh, to be in a workplace where um, they're not fit to be. One of the things that we did um, through the initial phase was set up that psychological um, and physiological helpline that worked across all our health families. That's still in place. It's still available to anyone who feels that need to outreach and actually look for, for the additional help and support that they do so it's not that it's not that we're not aware of them nor are we not supportive it's a piece of work uh we're currently working on in regards to that specific banding issue but also to make sure that they do get the help and support they do need because it's one of the things that why we have always brought forward uh the regulations uh that we have asked is to take the pressure off our health system and take the health pressure of our workforce. But people often say, and I get referred to it in regards to lockdown in the World Health Organization, uh, you know, said we shouldn't be using lockdowns as a measure to combat COVID-19. That statement also says, unless it's to relieve the pressures and strains and stresses uh, on your health workforce. Our health workforce has been underfunded, undersupported for the past 10 years. We've been doing an intensive piece of work to get that back up to scratch. We're trying to do it under the auspices and during a pandemic as well. So look, the support that, that our healthcare staff needs is not found wanting on my behalf, uh, nor is it found wanting in the support it gets from the committee's behalf as well. And I welcome that because it does come when I do have to go uh, to executive colleagues to ask for additional and extended supports that I hope the members uh, around uh, this committee table and also around the chamber will also give me that same support at that same time as well. Okay, thank you. A really quick comment from Paula on that. Uh, Minister, um, you, you promised many months ago that you would bring forward safe staffing legislation. What we heard in the call with the ICU nurses, they're not working in a safe environment. When will you be bringing that forward to this committee for scrutiny? Thank you. Um, thanks, Paula. That, that, that is one of the pieces of work and one of the commitments we gave, um, uh, well, actually, the executive committed to. Uh, to get our healthcare workers actually off the picket line. It, it's already ongoing. Uh, it's a piece of, of, of work, it's a conversation that has been uh, started and started recently between trade union side and my department officials and our workforce director uh, in regards to what that legislation will look like, uh, whether we have actually time and when we have time to get it through this mandate, whether we can do it by framework, whether we can do it by legislation. So that's a piece of detailed work that, is, that has started, um, 
But what I will say, it's a piece of work for the sake of our workforce we have to get right. And we have to put in the time and the dedication to get it right now because those workers and the, the workers across our healthcare system do need that support and do need that reassurance through legislation or through a framework that the conditions that they're working in and the support measures that we provide, um, not just as a department, but as an executive and as a society, uh, really acknowledge the work and the commitment that they give. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, members, and thank you very much to our panel this morning. And I think we all welcome the opportunity to get discussing something of a more positive nature. We're very conscious that we're heading into a Christmas period, which is still uh, dangerous, and that that measures are still required, both uh, both in terms of restrictions potentially and the individual measures. But thank you very much, and I wish you all the very best in the time ahead in the in the very important work that you're all engaged in. Thank you for now, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, members, um, thank you. So we're now going to revert to agenda item two there and maybe just take a very short break there before we go back to can agenda. I, can I raise a point? Yep. And I don't know how other members feel, but I, I'm extremely frustrated at our ability to scrutinise an issue of such significant importance. When you take in, today was a ministerial and CMO update on COVID, on COVID and a presentation on a vaccine. After the presentation, which to my record was 23 minutes. It left 37 minutes for questioning. Not including ministerial or CMO responses, or indeed Mrs Donnelly's, who, whom I respect and I, I like to listen to. Members had at least one minute each to ask questions on what is the most serious issue of our lifetime. I think it is hugely inadequate, and I think it is a disservice to the scrutiny ability of this committee that we are giving one minute to ask questions on not only COVID response, but on a vaccine. I think this committee needs to take this up. It is not good enough to have a presentation via video link on an issue so, of such importance of this. And for committee members, what scrutiny can we give that under one minute? It is absolutely disgraceful. And I don't say that uh, because of the responses of any of the people that were involved in the presentation. But the ability of this committee to, to scrutinise is significantly undermined at a time of critical national importance. And I feel very passionate about it, and I think we need to take this issue up. I'd be interested to hear other members' views on that too. As, as would I. Go, go ahead. Well, we've been okay. saying this for months. I mean, it has been hugely frustrating. One session I didn't even get asking a question if we ran out of time. I mean, it is just not good enough. I totally agree with everything you said. Thank you. Do yeah, I agree with everything you said as well, Jonathan, and we have been saying it for months. And I mean, I, I specifically wanted to raise the uh, issue of ICU nurses. I, I give the, the clerk, uh, obviously, I asked the minister for a uh, warning about that, and I you know, didn't get, didn't scratch the surface of the issue and never mind the vaccine question. So it's something we've been banging on about for a while. I think we all appreciate the minister is obviously busy, but you know, scrutiny, scrutiny has to come as well. It can't be just a minister doing, um, you know, often as, not as own, but often the work without scrutiny. So. I agree with that. Yeah, Pam. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I agree with all the comments as well. And I think to the point that it was via video link. I think it was particularly bad time today for whatever reasons. It would have been better to have, um, you know, witnesses here, and, and the room would have been much more useful. But I, I was very glad that uh, Jerry got in with the safe staffing legislation issue because certainly I had a meeting, a law meeting last night with. RCM and it's it's horrendous what the nurses are facing absolutely horrendous and this needs dealt with and I'm, I'm actually really disappointed to hear that response in terms of uh, in terms of sorry Paula's question on the uh, legislation for safe staffing because a conversation has started with the answer I'm horrified I really am horrified this is almost a year and the nurses feel like that they are in a much worse place than they were a year ago when actually this place is growing like uh, you know problems have been solved, they haven't been solved. I mean, I, I'm hearing about ICU nurses who are leaving their posts who have resigned to dog walk, mm -hmm. to dog walk and to work in supermarkets because the pressure is too much and for all that they're um, being paid as well. It's yep. shameful. And, and, I, and I am aware that, that there, there's additional pressure being placed on ICU in particular as a result of bank staff coming in who, with the best will in the world, are just not 
experience in that environment, and that's, that's placing extra pressure on. And, and I'm also aware, and, and again, I'll, I'll express the interest that I have before, that my wife is a nurse, but I know the community teams are similarly under pressure, the entire system is under pressure, and I think that is a huge Absolutely, priority. Absolutely, Chair, and I would like to ask too, you know, where, in the first wave, we had marquees, and we had hot food provision, hot drinks for breaks for, for these workers. Where, where is that now? It's worse than ever. This wave has been much worse than the first one. Yeah. And they have little to no breaks and no provision in, in, a, in any shape or form. It's, it's yeah. and, and actually, and, and we will, we, we have agreed that we will get some of the trusts at least in before. before and I think those are some of the questions. That, I'm going to go to the phones here for in this discussion. I'll come back to you, Alan. So I'm going to go to Pat first, then Colin. Uh, thanks, Chair. And, and yes, I agree with uh, everything Jonathan said there. And you know, we have been banging this drum for quite a while. I mean, e even this morning there, I mean, Orlea asked a question, for example, about community pharmacy. Was, and I'm not, I'm not saying Patricia avoided answering that question, uh, but if we had time, Orlea would have been able to come back in. My, my question was actually giving the minister an opportunity to sell this rollout of the vaccine uh, when what he did was defend issues that had happened in the past. And, and, and that wasn't what I wanted. Uh, but of course, we couldn't come back in again. So those are just a couple of examples about how we can't really scrutinise the, the, the minister and the department properly. Yeah. And Colin? Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. And I suppose maybe all I can say is, Jonathan, welcome to the committee. We've been, this is what it's been for months and months, uh, for, for any of the length of time that I've been on it. I think we suffer from multiple panels, multi-people panels, where once you put three people on a panel and you've got nine committee members answering, asking two questions, okay. you have to multiply it. Nine people by two questions, by three responses. And if you're trying to squeeze that into 90 minutes it's, with a presentation, it's just not going to work. And then multiple panels right throughout the day uh, becomes quite tiring as well to try and focus and, and get that time in. I know certainly um, from the Executive Office Committee, we try to cap it at two presentations per day because I think once you go beyond that, um, it, it just becomes almost impossible. But I wanted to raise an issue, and I would like maybe if we could just to write to get clarity from the Minister, and I was waiting to get to the second round, um, and it's about specifically the type of vaccine that will be used in care homes, because obviously the one that's been approved has the very high level of, of needing um, like minus 70, so there will be logistical problems with transportation. And if they're going to rely, like I think I heard somewhere in some of the news reports that they're going to use the second type of um, vaccine that comes to, to go into care homes with and I think there's been some concerns with that vaccine and needing some additional testing so I want to find out if there's a delay potentially to that or is it the intention to use this first um, approved vaccine for all care homes um, and would it be possible Chair maybe to write to the department to seek that clarity? Okay thank you I'm going to Alan and I'm going to come back around. Yes uh... Mr. Chairman, yeah, it is. It, I mean, we are trying to compress an awful lot in the very short uh, amount of time. Uh, I think the minister has made himself available to the committee. He comes on a, a, on a regular basis. I'm, I'm not sure that all the other committees uh, in the Assembly enjoy the same amount of attendance uh, by their ministers, but um, the, at the end of the day, those ministers are not uh, at the forefront of fighting a, a pandemic. Um, I think as well that uh, maybe uh, you know we need to take a look at ourselves uh, as a committee. Uh, maybe our uh, forward programming uh, is is all wrong. Uh, I mean today uh, we're dealing with uh, the rollout of a vaccine. It's a big it's a big story out there. There's a lot of concerns around it. There's a lot of logistics involved. Um, and we have tried to, we've all been rushed. It's a, you've got one question, get it in, get it answered, next. Uh, and we aren't getting that uh, that time, but yet we're devoting an hour and a half here to uh, in, uh, an international uh, panel of, of people who are going to talk to us. No doubt it'll be very, very interesting, and no doubt we'll, we'll pick up a few points from it. Um, but I'm just wondering, uh, if you set that hour and a half uh, that we are going to spend with these international people against uh, the, the pressing matter of the day, which is the vaccine, 
Are the two comparable? Is, is that a good use of our time, that we're using the same amount of time to deal with the vaccine rollout, that we're going to speak to these people? And I don't know what it is we're going to learn from them today or, or what it's going to benefit. Uh, and I think if you look at our, our forward programming, uh, maybe we do. Maybe there's stuff that we're, we're, we're just trying to pad out, uh, uh, make an agenda. Uh, and bringing various people in to listen to what they have to say when there are really more pressing matters for the committee to be addressing. But certainly, I would have liked to have spent much more time. And I'm just wondering if, you know, it, it, Patricia uh, probably could have dealt with an awful lot of the, the concerns and questions that we had uh, around the vaccine. Uh, and maybe, you know, we should be inviting people like Patricia along. Uh, for an hour and a half just to talk about one subject rather than trying to you know, press an awful lot in uh, to, uh, to, to the time that we have. So I, okay. I, I just think we need to maybe take a look at how we conduct our business. Okay, well, first of all, just to, just to make it clear to members, we have consistently asked for more time from the Minister. I recognise and I agree with, with those points as well that there, there is too much of a rush on scrutiny. Um, I don't actually believe that we're padding out the agenda. I think there is so much of importance that we're dealing with. And international best practice and learning, I think, is hugely relevant in terms of moving, moving forward with, with this. Um, and we can look at, at potentially doing additional sessions. I think the vaccine certainly is an important issue. And we, we can look for, I think, additional probably uh, briefings. It's also important to bear in mind that when we were discussing setting up this session, I had asked the minister and his team to keep that briefing very, very short. Yeah. However, in the meantime, while this was all going on, the vaccine then became available. And I think that then created uh, an expectation from the public that, that a large part of this would look at issues around the vaccine. So it's dynamic in that sense that events sometimes overtake the plans and, and the best led plans. But I agree that we do certainly need more time with the minister. And I think uh, I'm, I'm quite happy that we draft a letter and express that. I'm going to Pam yep. first for a very quick point. Yep. I want to draw this to a conclusion now, members, because we do have other significant business today. Yep. Pam. Thanks, Chair. I think, it, to be fair, you know, the Minister has an incredible amount of pressure. And, and you know, we met here at half eight this morning, and the Minister making himself available at quarter to nine in the morning is, is, is very welcome. Uh, so I th don't think we, can't, we can't be too hard on him. But I suppose just find a way forward so that we do get more time would be would be good. But just on the back of what Colin was saying, um, if I'd got in for another question, that's exactly what I want to ask around, was that the first vaccine and the second vaccine, which has not yet been approved, but we understand the AstraZeneca one is the one that will be used in the homes because of the <coughs> conditions of storage and stuff. It's, it'll be more uh, mobile. Um, but I was going to, if I had a, the opportunity, I would have asked on the first vaccine, which would obviously require people to travel to a vaccine centre because of the storage and the lifespan of it and the, the very large number in, in those packs as they're defrosted. But I was going to ask actually, you know, for those uh, people living who are highly vulnerable in care settings, and I would include, you know, um, supported living type units and stuff, but people who are at much more vulnerable age but are maybe not receiving personal care who would be fit to travel to a vaccination centre that, you know, are they looking at whether they can be included in that very first vaccine, which may not be suitable for for people who are not fit to actually are mobile enough to go out to a vaccine centre. But I'm sure there are quite a large section of the community who would be, whilst they may be uh, in older years, would be still able to travel to a vaccine centre to avail of that initial vaccine. Yeah, and, like yeah and, and, and just to indicate to members, we have already asked for a dedicated session on the vaccine again next, next early next year, because we, there is a recognition that this is ongoing and this will require ongoing scrutiny. It's, I'm, I'm also quite happy if members want to uh, indicate some questions that weren't got to in this session, put those in writing, and we have done that before. That doesn't take away from the core need to get greater amounts of time to do this scrutiny, and I think that is with whoever is most relevant to answer the questions. And I'm also happy that we can look at, at having Patricia back for another session um, early in the new year or whatever. I'm going to Jonathan and uh, then very yeah. quickly. To no, and I'm glad to hear the, the committee's concerns on this on this particular subject. Like. Maybe it's a case that, that the Thursday is a bad day to have the Minister's briefing. Perhaps we could look at a day of the sitting assembly. I know other committees meet at a time uh, in a committee room to be able to discuss and have the briefing from the Minister when he's actually maybe in, given qu in question time. There may be time allocated. 
we need to look at creative ways in which we can scrutinise this. It's, it's only but fair to give this issue due process. And I, I disagree with what Alan says in relation to this committee's work and the forward work planning, because as for the international experts, I, for one, am looking forward to hearing from them, because you know, that was what my question was leading on to, because from those uh, forward work plans in relation to international experts, we see that Germany has five tracers per 20,000 people. Uh, I think what the minister said in my question, I didn't get a chance to respond to him, was that in four weeks the uh, contact tracers have went from 220 to 269, increase of 49 people. When this committee brought a motion two weeks ago, and we listened to everybody uh, reiterate the importance of contract tracers, I know that some people in the committee have em emphasised that reason as well, to uh, model Germany's uh, representative model and contact tracers, we would need 450 people. But there is no ability for us to scrutinise the Minister and the CMO in relation to the progress. In fact, the Minister said in, in his opening presentation that he was confident in the test and trace programme. But, and, and he may well, that may well be so, but I, I, as a committee member, expect to elaborate on that and probe those particular questions. Yeah. So I think we need to look at it. Yeah, and, ab and absolutely. And we have actually done, previously done additional sessions on Tuesday. Uh, now, those all bring their own challenges, members. We have to be realistic that those, those challenge members own time as well, and, 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 and we need to be aware of that. So I'm quite happy to consider any, any option that gives us the, the chance to apply better scrutiny, and I think we'll go in and take a look at that and see what, what we can. But we, we, we recognise, and, and we have recognised the problem, we have asked for longer time, and while the Minister does come on a regular basis, there is so much going on within health that there's a requirement here that, that we do get the chance to drill into issues more, more, uh, in more depth and in more detail. The reason why I suggest a sitting day for the Minister is perhaps he might be in the House on business, that perhaps maybe that could tailor in with his dairy commitments. And I do recognise he does come before the committee, and rightly so, and as would any Minister, if the issue pertaining to them was so important. Yeah. Well, our members, our members content, would, would members... Uh, Agree that we look for an additional session now before Christmas with the minister on a Tuesday lunchtime to pick up on some of the issues we weren't able Absolutely. to do today. Okay, members, members content with that. Members also can uh, forward questions outstanding from today, and we forward those on. Um, do members want to ask Patricia Donnelly back in advance of Christmas, or do members think that would be more use after Christmas to see how the Christmas period has gone? In terms of getting vaccine out, what's members' views? Sure, I, I would personally would like to hear from Patricia as this is about to be rolled out, because I'm sure other members have a lot more questions in relation to workforce yeah. uh, planning uh, and logistical issues that we didn't get a chance to ask. Yeah. Now, Patricia is just for members' information as to our first meeting back after Christmas. Uh, Patricia I, I, is already invited to that. Yeah. So, what do members feel? Do they want to move that? Or I, do they want I to think before Christmas, sure, because that'll be a lot of weeks away. You know, it'll be I think second week in January, is it, or whatever day it is. So. And it'll be quite a long period away, so I would like to have it before Christmas. Okay, go ahead. My, my suggestion then is can we please invite the Royal College of Nursing back as well? Because obviously that's the secondary issue that we've been sort of discussing today, but I think that the ICU nurses need to be heard. I would agree with okay. that. Okay, members. So we will, we will, uh, and that, and that involves a significant amount of work in terms of the staff as well. I should, I should flag that up. But um, we will, we will look for that and. Um, I think we need to address the issue more long term rather than um, rather than you know kind of piecemeal solutions. But at least those sure. those will provide sure. some. Quickly, did, did we? I think we talked about a Wednesday meeting before. Was there issues with Wednesday meetings? Because I think the executive meets on Thursdays, doesn't it? So would that allow for minister to be here longer? Or what was the issue with Wednesday? There were issues around scheduling now that, sure. um, but I suppose it's something we can look at again. And and you know absolutely, I I, I would see some merit. But there was issues with scheduling with other committees and things like that. But if members wish, we can take a look at it again and come back and see if it's a, if it's a possibility. Um, okay. Um, okay, members. Thank you. That's a useful and an important discussion. I think that's that's something that we do need to uh, see some some uh, progress on. Uh, thank you. We will take a short break there and come back at ten thirty, please, for our international panel. Thank you. Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. OK, members, thank you. Uh, we're moving on then to item six on our, Clara, our agenda today, which is part of our COVID-19 disease response ongoing work. And today we are delighted to be receiving a briefing from international academics. So the academics are, uh, come from uh, a number of academics. We have on the line two at present, and we're waiting for a third member to join. But they are from the field of epidemiology and global public health. Um, I think over this past period of time, we have seen the kind of uh, emergence of, of people who are very, very well versed in their field and who have provided advice and support and, uh, to governments and societies in relation to dealing with, with what has been a very, very unprecedented situation. And I think um, we as a committee have, from the very early stages of this, set our, our face toward learning as much as we can from international best practice and trying to ensure that that learning and any benefit to derive from it is brought in, into the situation that we have here in the north and indeed right across the island and indeed right across these islands. I think uh, it's, it's hugely welcome and I really, really have to say that I appreciate the time that the experts are giving us this morning in order to inform our consideration in order to better equip us to scrutinise and apply that, that role that we have to the Department of Health. So I will like to now welcome to our, to our, our meeting this morning Mr Azim Majid, who is Professor of Primary Cure and Public Health, Imperial College London. Mr Ralph Reintjes, Professor for Epidemiology and Public Health Surveillance, Hamburg University of Applied Science. And Ms Devi Schreeder, who is Professor of Global Public Health, University of Edinburgh. So you're all very, very welcome to Falsharov, Galer uh, and Shaw, or Mojin Shaw. You're very, very welcome here to our panel, and we're really looking forward to hearing your evidence and to engaging in some questions and answers with you all this morning. So could I now invite the, the professors to brief us? Uh, so we've allowed about five or ten minutes of an opening statement, uh, and then we hope to have a good discussion and a question and answer session. But if each of you in turn would like to maybe uh, provide us with a briefing, and if one of you wish to indicate that, that you'd like to uh, start that process, um, we'll, we'll go in any order that you choose. So, yes, Debbie, you're on screen there. So, Debbie yeah. Schrader, please go ahead. I'm happy to go first. So I just wanted to make five points about where we are with COVID-19. So first, as a global pandemic, it's still probably in chapter two. It still has a long way to run. Um, it's just recently that we're starting to see daily numbers starting to flatten. But until recently, every day we were seeing new records being set in terms of the number of cases and the number of deaths. Um, and so even if in richer countries, solutions become apparent, such as testing and vaccines, poorer countries are going to deal with this for years to come. The second thing is to talk about what we've learned and what we haven't learned over the past 10 months. We understand well now where transmission occurs, and this virus does not spread like flu. It spreads more in terms of clusters, super spreading events, and very specific locations. And this allows more targeted public health measures to be put in place rather than where we were, we're just locking people in their homes. I don't think we'll ever go back there because we know enough now to understand how we can keep people safe. We also know it's possible to control this virus and even in some instances eliminate it. Countries have done it and they have suppressed it. And there is kind of a playbook, which I'll come back to the end. But what we have seen, I think Northern Ireland might have had this experience as in Scotland, is that when you crunch the numbers and get them very low, like in the summer, 
The problem then is how do you stop reimportations of chains and new strains of the virus coming in? And how do you protect low prevalence in the context of a globalized world? The third point is what do we still not know? I think there's still huge questions around immunity. We don't fully understand how long immunity lasts. Antibodies seem to fade after about 12 weeks, but there's T cell responses that seem maybe six months at least. But this is a huge question and why governments are a little bit um, waiting to see and evolve their responses. We know there's long COVID, so substantial morbidity in young people, which we're not aware of at the start. Children are a puzzle, why they don't transmit the virus. It seems as much as adults, schools have not been centers of outbreaks when prevalence is low. And finally, we have vaccines on the horizon, but there are questions around, um, are these actually gonna stop transmission or just stop severe disease? And so that's a big unknown right now. Um, strategies moving forward. So the three kind of strategies countries took at the start when they saw this virus was first, what you can call a SARS strategy, an elimination strategy. This is what East Asian countries went for and Pacific countries, which is just get rid of the virus and then try to protect that. The second strategy was a, we call a control strategy, which is you try to control through some kind of acceptable incidents and keep the virus at a low enough level you can keep your economy going. But this is kind of a holding pattern until you can get a vaccine or until you could get some kind of true exit from this virus. And the third would be what you call a herd immunity strategy, which is a flu pandemic strategy. You let the virus go through because it seems like it's unstoppable. I would say very few countries have taken the third path willingly. Sweden a little bit dabbled in this, but they are now very clearly in the control box. And I think they openly say that. Um, in places like in Brazil, like in Manos, you have seen a largely uncontrolled epidemic and seroprevalence antibodies show about 75% of people there have had it and their death rates are pretty catastrophic. So it means it's not like you're going to reach up, you know, 30 or 40 percent and it just stops. It seems like the epidemic keeps going until a substantial bulk of the population has the virus. So finally, what is best practice moving forward and how to manage this? Obviously, it's easier to eliminate it if you're an island. If you're not and you have shared borders, all you can do is have strong suppression mechanisms. And the three things, and I'll end here, are first, really good test, trace, isolate, and emphasis on isolation. It makes no point finding people if they don't isolate. The whole point of testing is to find people to break those chains. The second thing is very good border checks so you don't reimport strains, testing at airports, quarantine procedures, and you know making sure you're trying to keep any new chains coming in um, quickly caught. And the third is very good voluntary guidance to the public about avoiding this at all ages. You don't want to get this virus if you're 20 or if you're 70. There are easy ways to avoid it. Wearing face coverings, avoided crowded spaces, and recognizing the aerosol dimension of this virus, that the way it spreads indoors is probably more like smoking, like cigarette smoke, than it is that if you sit two meters apart and wash your hands that you won't get it. And I think those dimensions haven't necessarily been emphasized enough throughout European countries, as well as in the different parts of the UK. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Debbie. And we'll go then to um, could have a map. we'll go to Ralph, please. Ralph, could you give us your opening remarks? Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think Devi pointed out, uh, gave a very, very clear overview about uh, um, the most most aspects we have to take uh, or we have to think about. Um, what we, what I would like to add is um, that we normally have to think about in which phase we are. In, um, and this depends on the country or in the region where you, where you're looking at. Um, some strategies uh, do work uh, very well at, at moderate or low numbers, but at the moment, in most parts of Europe, or many parts of Europe at least, are experiencing an extreme high number of cases, and therefore um, the more rigid uh, approaches uh, were necessary or are necessary, and uh, um, the coming months are certainly uh, going to be very difficult in, in controlling it. and. Some um, points which uh, Devi mentioned, also test, treat, and isolate, are extremely useful and uh, in, in a practical way. But um, with too high numbers, um, we, we come to our very strong limits in this area. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions after. Thank you very much, Professor Reinches. And then um, Professor Azim Majid. Professor, can you uh, go ahead, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to speak uh, today. So I think uh, Ralph and, and uh, Devi have given a very clear message about the key issues. Uh, in general, Europe has fared uh, much worse than some other countries in this pandemic. So across Europe, we've seen very high rates of infection, uh, high numbers of deaths, and a relatively suppressed infections we've seen in places like South Korea, uh, Taiwan, 
uh, or, um, or or New Zealand. Um, and I think uh, Davi has, has explained the reasons for those quite well. Uh, I think uh, looking forwards, um, there are lessons to be learned from the past. So one lesson is that uh, in the second wave we experienced in, in the UK, for example, uh, a large part of it was triggered by uh, infection in Spain. So analysis of, of, of the people infected with COVID-19 in the autumn showed a very high proportion, uh, up to 80% in the UK had a Spanish strain of coronavirus. So it does seem to be the case that people in Spain, uh, people travel to Spain during the summer, uh, perhaps weren't uh, very good in terms of their personal um, protection, were mixing in bars, restaurants, uh, nightclubs, and so on, became infected and came back to the UK and then spread the infection around the UK in this second wave. So it does illustrate the need for good border controls and good checks at borders. And people came back from high prevalence areas. Um, it is very intensive to contact trace. So I've got a paper coming out uh, hopefully soon which looks at the workload created by contact tracing. And I, I would estimate that for each case, you need about four contact uh, tracers or staff working in contact tracers, a mixture of administrative and, and uh, public health staff. So it's a very intensive um, process. Uh, I think in the UK, generally, we didn't do very well. We didn't have enough contact tracers across the UK early on. And so we're overwhelmed by the number of cases that we had. Uh, so I think one lesson going forward is we do need to be able to escalate contact tracing very rapidly in any future um, pandemic or future wave of the current uh, pandemic, uh, but that is obviously difficult to do. I think as Derry's highlighted, we do need rapid testing and suppression of local outbreaks. That is the key to stopping these outbreaks becoming um, much larger outbreaks and causing much more disability and death. And then finally on vaccination, there is positive news, but, it, but we're not there yet. The Pfizer vaccine that's been licensed in the UK it's quite difficult to administer because of its storage requirements. Uh, and so it's going to be limited probably to a few large centers uh, across the UK. Uh, and so I think in the long term, we need the other vaccines which can be stored in normal vaccine fridges, uh, which can be used more easily in the community uh, and also in lower income countries. So I think we are a long way yet from having an effective vaccine policy uh, because of the issues around the Pfizer vaccine and the need for more stable vaccines that can be used more easily in community settings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you all. And um, I suppose going back to your remarks, Professor Schrader, um, in relation to the, the three strategies, the three broad strategies, um, and I suppose part of the context for us here in, in the North in particular is that we have a very, had a very under pressure health system in any case before even COVID. There were significant workforce gaps significant waiting lists, worse than, than many of, of the other parts of these islands. So we had a very, very poor base in terms of health, health provision, and that has been put under serious additional strain in relation to COVID-19. Now, we had actually, as a committee, written um, in July to the minister around zero COVID and suppression strategies and asking for his view on that at a time when we had the numbers here down quite low. We, we were down at, at uh, single digits. and. And there seemed to be an opportunity at that time. That opportunity seems to have passed, but it would certainly be hoped that we could get back into that. And the goal, I'm sure, would be to get back into that territory. So I wonder, and, and I'm also conscious, um, Professor Reinches, that you had said in, in some of your submissions that in Germany, Chancellor Merkel was aiming for five contact tracers per 20,000 people, which would equate, equate to around 450 here in the north. But I wonder, can you, panel members, outline for us what, what, in terms of our situation, what would our best future strategy be in terms of maintaining control and protecting our health service and saving lives and indeed the saving livelihoods? What do you think is our best uh, way forward now at this point in time? I can, yep, go ahead I can start. Yeah, no, I think that was um, a great articulation of where we were in the summer. So I guess the first thing I wanted to say is I think there's been a false dichotomy between the economy and health and these debates of should we prioritize thousands of COVID lives versus millions of people who will be affected by unemployment or recession. And I think it's the wrong way of looking at it. And we can see that from the economic evidence 10 months in. The places that have had largely uncontrolled epidemics have taken a much higher economic toll. And the places like South Korea and Taiwan, I mean, South Korea saw growth in quarter three. Their aviation sector is flourishing um, because they've managed to get the full domestic recovery and or close to it. And of course, they're impacted by being part of the global economy, but they at least have sheltered some of the behavioral change that occurs when the virus is circulating. Individuals and firms change their behavior because of the virus. So it is the virus killing your economy, not the restrictions alone. 
So what does this mean? I agree. In the summer, I also was a big advocate for what could be called zero COVID, an elimination strategy, COVID secure, maximum suppression, whatever name. No one liked any of the names. Um, it seemed to get you know people upset saying it's impossible. And the thing to say is that was our best way to avoid further lockdowns and restrictions. And we can't have it all right now. We cannot have our borders open and tourism and the pubs and hospitality and conferences and big sports games and life back to normal. With this virus, we just can't. And the reason is because of the hospitalization rate and how fast it grows exponentially. So you add in the exponential growth and the hospitalization rate, and you know you're going to hit that wall. And so governments have to put in place these draconian restrictions. So what does that mean now for Northern Ireland? Yes, there was an opportunity. This is how, exactly how I felt in Scotland, where we practically had eliminated the virus. We had single digits, most tests coming back negative. And it's how do you protect that? Um, and I think there, there's a hard conversation with the public about we need to get domestic recovery. You can't move abroad. And that's a very hard thing in a European context because people see freedom of movement as one of their basic rights. And I didn't fully understand that until I had tried to articulate it. And the people want to be able to move internationally easily. And it's just not possible if you want to suppress this and have a full domestic recovery. So I would say the two things to emphasize now for Northern Ireland are first, getting your testing turnaround time and the tracing, but the isolation. I think Europe has fallen down on managed isolation. It's estimates are that less than 20% of contacts actually even isolate for 14 days. It's a big ask. So payments to people, you pay them to stay home. It's an act of goodwill. They're doing it for others, not for themselves. They're already infectious and they have the virus. And also thinking about emotional, practical support, using hotel rooms that people can go to if they don't want to infect those in their family or in their flats. And the second thing I think is the border measures uh, and heading into the winter period that if you I'm very worried in the UK about the lifting of all travel restrictions over that five day Christmas period, because we've just moved into some parts of the country, a tiered system um, where you have low prevalence areas, which have more freedom and higher prevalence areas with more restrictions. It seems to be working with travel restrictions in place so people kind of stay where they are. We're going to lift them for five days and you're going to have movement all over. And for me, that dispels in January or February, we're going to be in another lockdown because you're going to have exactly that importation of cases from high prevalence to low prevalence areas. And those tiers are in tier zero, tier one, tier two, more open. will basically go back into lockdown. I know the tier system isn't being used in Northern Ireland, but it is a concern because I know there's a four nation agreement about movement across. So I would say also on your radar should be that because that's going to be a massive shock to the system, I think, over the Christmas period. Thank you. Um, yes, go ahead, uh, Professor Renches. Yeah. Yes, I would like to add something um, to this. Uh, David just said, like uh, moving around and um, uh, internationally, but also nationally, uh, has to be taken seriously. If you come from high uh, prevalence areas to low prevalence areas to spread uh, the disease, but the most important factor I think is um, is not to think that we might have, we will probably have lockdowns in in January or February. They are only the consequence of the extreme high uh, increase, which we will probably uh, of numbers, which we will probably see at that time. And the point is, if we want to get uh, life back close to normal, we need to get the numbers really to a level where it is controllable, where contact tracing and um, quarantine and isolation can can work. Uh, at, um, and your original question was like, what, uh, why uh, Chancellor Merkel um, put up uh, the number of uh, contact traces for a certain um, local health authority for a certain districts? It was only to identify like up to which level is contact tracing still possible um, with a certain amount of people. And um, the idea was at that time we provide for for an incident or for yeah for practically an incidence a seven day incidence of um, uh, 50 cases per 100,000 reported. For this, the number uh, of uh, contact traces would be sufficient to follow up and to uh, contact all all individuals locally and to put them under isolation uh, or quarantine um, and this way it could work. Um, you probably have noticed in, uh, that over recent weeks actually, the last six weeks or so, the situation in Germany has gone from pretty good to not so good anymore. Uh, but it's not all over the country. You have to see Germany is a country of, like like the UK, not four cu countries, but 16 countries, uh, 16 states. And the two most northern states, for example, um, have uh, 
um, have still managed to keep the number of reported cases uh, around or under the limit of this uh, manageable size. And here, the increase didn't take place. It's stable because up to a certain limit, the contact tracing still works. One in some other in many other parts of Germany, for, for more in the south, the numbers rapidly increased, uh, um, were far beyond this uh, this limit where it's uh, controllable, and therefore um, the the problems are, are are very very difficult to manage and to calm down. So in a way, we have to look at it where we are, but at which level? At some at a certain level, I think. Uh, the pandemic uh, can be the strategy to control can work, but at uh, other limits, uh, if we go beyond that, we will have the situation that the numbers are too high, and therefore, what David said, we will have to get them down. For example, with lockdown. So, so we we need to. It's uh, the virus is is not flexible. We have to or, uh, organize ourselves around. Uh, the given uh, situation, especially with the cold winter period, uh, with the virus, so that it can be controlled. Thank you. Thank you. And the second one from me then, before I go to members, uh, please. And um, I'm, I'm very conscious in, in your answer there, Professor Rentis, that we are, as of last Sunday, sitting around 130 cases. But clearly, the current restrictions are designed to bring that down. And I, I, I guess that as a committee, we are we are looking at how we have the capacity in place, ready to maximise that, that potential that you talk about when, when you have those figures around that level. In relation to the contact tracing operation here, there has been several references, and the department have briefed us on, on several occasions around what they describe as a digital first um, system where, where local, local, there's, there's screening and people receive either a ping on, a, on, a what, on an app or receive messages on, on by text. And given the amount of support that you've indicated, in particular around isolation and the need for, for good isolation to follow up the finding, testing, and tracing, um, is there, is there, are there examples anywhere else where digital first is a strategy or where it's worked as, as a strategy? Or is there uh, evidence of benefit of that human to human contact in terms of drilling further into the contacts? and also to provide that support. So what's your view in terms of that uh, digital first versus human contact tracing? Yeah, I'll go to any, any of the panel. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to speak on that. Um, yeah. So I think there has been obviously a lot of interest in digital contact tracing um, this year because manual contact tracing is so uh, resource intensive in terms of the people needed to do it. Uh, the evidence thus far is quite limited about its effectiveness and value. So because these are quite new interventions, there's very limited uh, evidence that they have uh, any, uh, any great benefits. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, you know, because it's still early days. But at this stage, the evidence is still still very sparse, because uh, I, I did read the evidence from my, my forthcoming paper, and, and it's currently very limited. Um, so I think we need to really evaluate programs around the world uh, and see how effective those are in terms of contact tracing. But for now, I think we are really um, forced to rely on manual contact tracing. Well, it's coming up by telephone as well as in person, but um, I think that's probably the way forward for now with, with, with IT-based solutions as kind of adjunct rather than a uh, replacement for, for standard methods of contact tracing. Thank you, Professor Majid. Uh, anyone else want to make a point on that before I go to members? I yeah, can go ahead. Add to that with two comments. The first is I think that's right, that humans have to be the basis of it because it's a detective work. Right, you need to figure out where someone's been and build their trust to be able for them to tell you this. Um, South Korea has used a more digital system, but they passed legislation after they had MERS, which gives them access to credit card details and location details of their population. I don't think that would work in a European context, especially given you know GDPR and where we head with privacy. So there's privacy concerns if you move into automating too much of this. But where I think it can be helpful is around isolation. So for example, in Singapore and Hong Kong, if you're asked to isolate, they make you download an app onto your phone and that app has a location service and twice a day or even three times a day they will contact you and with half an hour you have to respond which will give your location to make sure you're actually at home um, and i think those kind of ways of monitoring people through apps can take the bulk off of humans but i think it hasn't been used enough in the isolation context we ask people to isolate for 14 days and then leave them be and i think it's a really big ask, and you're also not really monitoring it properly. So I think there is a, you could gain a lot through having a robust app. 
Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go first of all to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, and then I'll go to Jerry, Paula, and then I will go to Pat on the phone and Colin on the phone. So I'm going first of all to Pam. Thank Thanks, you, Pam. Chair, and can I thank the panel for your attendance today? It's very interesting and you're, and you're very welcome. Um, I'm glad you've made time to come to our committee today. Um, just following on from the Chair's um, comments around the contact tracing, and I'm very interested to hear from, I'm sorry, I'm going to call you Dr. Ralph because I don't want to mispronounce your surname. Um, could, it, could you tell me, um, Dr. Ralph, how Germany's five tracers per 20,000 population compare with rates of recruitment in, in other countries? And um, you may be aware that we here in Northern Ireland have gone down the route of um, uh, our contact tracers having some form of clinical or medical background. Uh, but I'm just wondering what your view is that. Is it, is it necessarily a deficient option to retrain civil service staff to boost contact tracer numbers in your experience? So, you know, I'm asking really, is, is that clinical um, or medical training, is that necessary for contact tracers in, in your opinion? Yeah, okay, we'll go to the panel, please. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Sorry. Yes, go ahead, Professor Regis. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for your question. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, uh, the point is: Do they, um, as I understood, um, and to say it the other way around? In in our setting here, we have, um, in contrast to to England, for example, we have um, uh, organised contact tracing um, based on the local health authorities. And within the local health authorities, of course, the staffing was not sufficient. And exactly as you said, um, not only medical students, public health students and so on were, uh, were employed in addition to the normal staff, but also other civil servants were retrained um, in contact tracing. Even in some parts of the country, um, um, military personnel was, were used to, tr uh, to train to increase the number of contact tracers in the country or in the region. Um, uh, this this could work and this can work um, uh, from our experience uh, if you have a clear setting, if you've got experienced staff which can train them and which are uh, at their side and uh, um, ready for uh, to answer questions. So in a way, this is uh, uh, in in this already existing system. You it is possible to increase the numbers of. Uh, contact traces, but only as, as one can think to a certain limit. That's why um, the numbers of, um, um, th that's why we, we have a, a threshold where, uh, until which it can work. Um, and the other, you know, so the training part, yes. And why, why we are five per 20,000, it was just, um, um, modeled to the level um, which actually everybody thought in, or at least the politicians thought in the in the summer, spring and summer, uh, that fi uh, the a limit of uh, fifty per hundred thousand inhabitants in seven days uh, would be would be a high threshold. We now all experience that this, in reality, for doesn't hold for uh, autumn and winter. Could I, could I just ask, in Germany in particular, um, are the contact tracers, are they, uh, are they contacting people who are self-isolating to um, either support or ensure that they are actually complying with that and staying at home for those 14 or 10 days? This is, this is a plan. This is uh, supposed to be uh, the case. But, uh, and it worked for a while, but in, in, in depending on where you are here in the two northern states, um, this is um, as far as I know still the case. But in in the, the states where uh, in further in the south where the incidence rates are uh, much much higher, um, and this this uh, this is not uh, uh, possible anymore at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and I will go then to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Hi, Paul, for your presentation. Um, uh, Professor Sridhar, you said about you know health versus economy, and I, I agree with those sentiments. Uh, obviously, my party title being "People Before Profit" it changed well with what we're about. Uh, I believe that both were obviously neglected, health and economy, um, and uh, the, the effects we're, we're witnessing um, now. Uh, I wanted to ask you. Um, 
about zero COVID, um, the benefits of it, and, and what situation would we have been in, both in Ireland and maybe uh, in Britain, you're, you're may, uh, maybe better able to speak to that. Uh, what different situation would we have been in uh, if governments had have adopted a zero COVID and elimination strategy? Yeah, I mean, the best way to avoid future lockdowns is to keep your numbers low. And the best way to keep your numbers low is when you have them low to, to maintain a strategy to, make, to keep them there. And that's what a zero COVID strategy would have done. So obviously there's an alternative version of reality where this summer, um, you know, all four nations, as well as Ireland, because we all share borders, you needed a two island strategy really, um, had agreed to this, had encouraged people not to travel abroad, had convinced the airlines that in the longer term, anyway, passenger traffic had collapsed. And so at this point, you know, there anyway needed to be a longer term strategy to aviation than just trying to revive it over the summer through kind of a short term boost, um, try to make people stay cautious. So I think the eat out to help out scheme was quite a risky one, you kind of subsidize the riskiest behavior. They could have used that to subsidize takeaways, local commerce, local shops, rather than um, indoor dining, which we know is high risk to really get those numbers low. And then hopefully we would have been living pretty much like places in East Asia with most of the economy open, except moving and traveling across borders. For me, the, the choice for countries um, is really, and especially islands, particularly Germany's in a different position. It has borders with nine countries, so you can't really <laughs> isolate your off, but we're in a privileged position to be two islands, is either you're gonna live with daily restrictions on your life because we need to stop super spreading events and keep hospitalization rates low, um, but you can move around easily or you can't move around easily, but you get most of your daily life back in terms of your normal daily routines. That's the trade-off of countries. It seems like Europeans and, um, and I say Europeans at all, but also Irish, British, we all wanted it all. We wanted our lives back and the summer gave a glimpse of that because the numbers were low and kind of a false promise. But I think we are definitely paying for our winter, you know, our summer holidays with winter lockdowns. It's very clear, especially when you see the genetic sequencing of where new strains are coming from. Yeah, thanks, and I agree. I think the summer approach was, was catastrophic. Things were opened far too quickly um, when the R8 was still at a, at a high level. Uh, and, and we're seeing a, a scheme that is grand uh, as the help, uh, eat it to help out scheme, but there's a scheme being developed here about encouraging people to go to shops in January. So uh, I think that needs to be assessed whether that would be uh, increase the, the, the rate of infection. Just finally, um, uh, what is the likelihood of a of a mutation of coronavirus in the future? I know it's maybe early stages, but is there any thought in epidemiology or vi virology about the possibility of a, a new virus? Hopefully not, but I just wanted to, to ask if there's any uh, thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, uh, thus far, uh, the virus has mutated, but those mutations have generally been quite, quite small and haven't really impacted on its effectivity or fatality. Uh, so, so far, the evidence has mutated in a way that would make it more serious. Obviously, in the long term, we need to monitor the, uh, the virus and see how it mutates. But, but, it's, but thus far, we've not seen any great evidence of any changes that would make it more infective or more, more, more fatal to, to people. Thank you. If I, could, I might come in on, on that one. Um, I agree with that. And I, but I would say one of the worries is the mutations that might occur with the constant movement between the virus between humans and animals. So there's the mink situation in Denmark, and that was very, I found that incredibly worrying. Luckily, Denmark moved very rapidly to make sure nobody moved in or out of that area. And they killed about 17 million mink. Um, I didn't know they had that many mink um, in Denmark. And so I think the thing to remember with the mutations is the more, the higher your prevalence and the more likelihood it can jump into other species. And it seems to jump easily into lions, tigers, cats. I mean, it did, it, this virus jumps easily back and forth. The more likely you have a mutation, that that mutation is radically different that your vaccine will not work again against that strain that's the concern so i think if you're thinking of policy something that worries me is we focus a lot on bioweapons and kind of you know manufacturing of viruses but you don't need to have a bioweapon factory if you have 17 million mink sitting together in very crowded conditions we need to be looking at how animals are being housed and kept because otherwise that's where our next mutation is going to come from and where it'll hit us is probably with the vaccine thank you Thank you. And I will go then to Paula. Um, thank you, panel, for coming along this morning. It's been very interesting. My question um, relates to ventilation. I think um, it's been touched on there. I had a constituent contact me, help, volunteers on a, on a help child, childline helpline, um, who'd contacted to say that he's so cold in the classroom, he can't afford a coat, and he's too embarrassed to tell his teacher. 
How have the colder countries of Europe dealt with the need to keep the classrooms well ventilated, but also be cognizant of the needs of the children who are in the classroom who are sitting shivering? It's the first question. Thank you. Uh, so ventilation is essential to cutting the spread of the virus indoors. So it's been uh, quite clearly shown that if you ventilate rooms uh, properly, the virus does disperse much more quickly and the rate of infection is much, much lower. Uh, obviously, that's much easier in summer than in winter months, particularly in northern uh, European countries. So when you think about ways we can improve ventilation without uh, affecting people's uh, health in, in other ways, and there are lessons there from the animal industry, which um, had developed systems of, of ventilating planes, for example, um, and also fil filtering air, and as a consequence, has quite low rates of infection on aircraft. So I think we could draw lessons from, from, from the animal industry and other sectors about how we might uh, address this issue in the longer term. But I agree, in the short term, it's difficult because um, schools haven't got systems for ventilating uh, their buildings very easily or filtering air, for example. Um, but it is essential to cutting the risk of infection going forwards. Um, just a second question, then, also on ventilation. Um, the, the app that we have in Northern Ireland, um, the diagnostic keys, whenever they're notifying somebody who's been in close proximity to somebody who's tested positive, only still measure up to, to being, being within two metres. Um, but again, we know that the ventilation, if you're sitting in the room, it, it, it's nearly, you're there for over an hour, maybe two hours, then everybody in that restaurant is going to be infected. How have other apps um, dealt with that, um, sort of the technological side to it in, in other countries? Thank you. Um, so in some other countries, if, if there's an outbreak, say in a restaurant, uh, everyone in the restaurant will be contacted, uh, not just those who are in close contact with the case. For these, you've mentioned that the virus could be airborne to some extent and, and circulate for, for a period of time. So in many countries, you'll get a, a notification that you're in a, in a building, such as a restaurant or, or another location where there was a confirmed case. Thank you. Oh, I think he's, the gentleman's indicated. Yes, go ahead, uh, Professor Rangers. Yes. Um, yes, I would just like to add two things. Exactly what uh, uh, Azim just said is uh, about the contact tracing of uh, um, all visitors of restaurants and so on. Therefore, um, the data is normally collected in various countries at the moment. Uh, and about the first question, I would like to add that, of course, next to opening the windows, and it depends on the classrooms, if, if there's only one small window on one side, it's, uh, the ventilation is not really really going to be very efficient. It uh, should, be, should be possible that uh, it's, uh, good ventilation takes place. But alternatively, in um, various places, at least in, in this country, um, uh, there are um, more and more um, indoor uh, ventilations and filtering system, uh, mobile filtering system are being used and uh, tested and being used. And also more and more another, um, at least that's, that's what, what is being uh, uh, done in, here in, in my university at the moment is um, you can also use UVC light uh, to eliminate the virus. So uh, there's, there's more than opening windows with freezing temperatures uh, for the whole time, which is which of course is unbearable for uh, for pupil for the whole winter. So there are opportunities. We just need to need need to look at them and to need to invest a little bit more in in um, protective um, environment or air filtering if we want the schools to continue um, as they continued while schools certainly do play a role in also in the spread of the disease in in societies which probably you can clearly see that germany which is under a uh, semi lockdown for four weeks now or five weeks almost and um, the numbers have stabilized on a very very high level but they're not decreasing because we our, our semi lockdown means like schools open as normal just with face masks so uh, a big contribution in society continues while you close other things. So we, this is a, an issue which I think uh, should not be neglected. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm going to go across then to the phone lines, uh, video conferencing, and first of all going to Pat Sheehan. Pat, do you have a question for the panel today, please? Yes, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to the panel for this very interesting presentation this morning. I think any objective observer would say there are 
clear weaknesses in our contact tracing system. First of all, it's understaffed. Uh, we discovered in October there were only 88 full-time equivalents involved in it. And at that time, we were getting nearly 1,000 positive cases a day. And I suppose any system would be overwhelmed with that number of cases. However, it also relies, as you heard earlier, on digital people are contacted either through the app or by text message. And there's no real enforcement or compliance with isolation. So those are fundamental difficulties as I see it. Now, uh, it has been mentioned recently that we can expect to see rapid testing arriving within weeks. And I'm just wondering what the panel thinks of the efficacy of rapid testing if there isn't a proper, solid, uh, rigorous and robust contact tracing system to, uh, to operate. Uh, and just a second question, uh, I'm wonder, wondering if any of you can give an opinion as to why Western countries are so reluctant to follow international best practice and the examples that have been set by, you know, particularly the Southeast Asian countries like uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Vietnam, a combined population of 178 and a half million, uh, and yet they have had fewer combined deaths than we have had here in the north of Ireland. So those are my two questions. Thanks very much. Thank you. So yes, go ahead, Professor Schrader, first. And we'll yeah, great. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief. On the first, on mass testing and isolation, I think this is really promising. And actually, in some way, if you have rapid tests and you can test people um, in, in bulk, Slovakia has tested their whole adult population almost twice now, you know, three and a half million people in one weekend, um, contact tracing becomes ne less necessary because in a way you're just doing everyone, so you don't need to actually do the tracing. So I think mass testing is one of our few ways out of it, but it has to be linked to isolation. In Liverpool, one of the problems has been uptake is low. People don't want to get tested. And the reason is if they get tested, then they have to isolate and they're being penalized. And so if you feel fine, why would you want to get tested? Hong Kong has also faced this as well. So it's not just a, an experience here. So I think in New York City, I've joined their COVID advisory group for, for several meetings and their um, isolation numbers are over 95%. So I asked them, how did you get there? Three things they've done. So the first thing they've done is they pay people pretty much their own wage to stay home. It's their job to stay home. Secondly, they offer emotional support. So someone checks on you every day, brings you essential foods, goods, make sure you're doing fine. And the third is they've offered hotel rooms to people, which they've had actually quite a lot of people want to take up to get out of their homes and not expose others. On the second point on why European countries haven't followed, I think in January, because I've been following this since actually 5th of January when WHO notified the world about a pneumonia-like cluster, your East Asian countries saw this and said, it's SARS, we're gonna eliminate it, and they tried. African countries followed WHO and Dr. Tedros, who said to them, you will never be able to treat your way through this. You do not have enough oxygen and ventilators. You've got to keep your numbers low. So Mali shut all of its borders before it had its first case, because they knew they could not, they understood the clinical need was beyond any of their resources. And European countries saw this and saw flu. And they followed their flu pandemic plans in general. There are differences. But I think even now in Europe, there's a feeling of, can we actually eliminate this? Can we actually control it? Are we all going to get it? And debates about herd immunity and do we have to live with the virus? East Asian countries said, we don't want to live with it. And so I think in a way, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. What you saw in January with this virus is what has kind of played out in the months to come. Thank you. Do any other panel members wish to contribute on that point? I, I would just like to, to add to what David just said. Um, um, one of the points is uh, that we, um, yeah, there, there are two points actually. One, one of the things I think is like that many European politicians want to be, uh, I, I want to be very, very careful when they're, um, they don't want to irritate their um, uh, society because they're all, all, most of the discussion are about restrictions and not that the restrictions really really help us to to calm um, calm the problem down. Um, this is this is probably our, uh, the the common European uh, situation. Um, but uh, the um, and I forgot the most important other part. Sorry, sorry. I'll come back maybe later. Uh, thanks. So 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 I I, I would agree fully with uh, with, with Devi. I think in Southeast Asian countries, they had experienced SARS and MERS in the past, and so were well-primed to respond quickly, whereas in the UK, 
our planning was really around pandemic flu uh, rather than SARS or MERS. And so all our plans were based around dealing with a flu type pandemic rather than a coronavirus pandemic. Okay, thank you. Excellent. In, yep. in Europe, and in Europe, we the focus well, the indicator which we normally look at is the uh, hospital capacity. At least uh, in Germany, there's been always a discussion like how many ventilators, how many intensive care rooms do we have? And uh, it's acceptable up to that limit. Uh, while in Southeast Asia, um, this, uh, one looks at in a different way. We're just wait, uh, we, we have been accepting um, uh, that the cases go up to, to a certain limit and which I think is, is the wrong strategy. We rather should look at what we've been discussing before at up to which level can our society deal with the cases with contact tracing and isolation and not with how many how many beds do we have which we can fill so i yeah. come back on on that because it reminded me of something which is in january and i think this is where europe also struggled the modeling was really off so the models and what we were i was seeing was that 80 percent of the chinese population would get this virus they would have over a hundred thousand infections within days because they modeled it off flu so it was seen as uncontrollable that everyone every country would take the same number of deaths the only difference would be um service capacity so the whole obsession with like where is flattening the curve under that capacity which puts you into lockdown release cycles to stay within that um, where I think we saw China, through whatever measures, you can talk about how extreme they are, they crunched it. They have not had community transmission for days. South Korea went a different path of mass testing and isolation. So all of a sudden, something that European countries saw as uncontrollable based on the modeling became controllable. And so in a way, I do think we rely too heavily on models in Western countries instead of actually just practical public health, which is don't let the virus come in. And when it comes in, try to get rid of it. Thank you. Uh, Professor Rentis, were you looking back in there? No, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I'll go, Pat, just check if you another one before, given that you're on the phone there. Do you have another one before I go to Colin? No, that's, that's great. Thanks. Okay. okay, Colin McGrath and Colin, can we have a question from you, please? Or two. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to the panel. It's been a, a, a great presentation. Of certainly a lot of learning and, and also I think um, has maybe helped to, to sort of clarify a few of the things that we would get attacked for on social media as well and um, so it's good to nip those in the buds and I, I recognize the, the remark made um, there about the models being wrong because I think that did create a difficulty at the very start because we were being you know the model was showing that we were going to have huge amounts of deaths and then when that didn't arrive, people thought that then it wasn't something to worry about because we were it was being over-suggested. And then I think that caused a bit of a problem in terms of trust because people felt that the modelling wasn't um, borne out and therefore they didn't really believe a lot of what they were hearing after that. Um, and I also noticed as well in some of the papers that you provided that maybe some of those other Asian companies as well have very high thresholds of um, fines uh, which maybe has, has resulted in, in real conformity. I think in South Korea there, it's been listed as um, around about seven or eight thousand pounds of a fine if you were caught outside of the house. And I'm sure if if that was brought here, which I don't think would be the case, it would certainly uh, you would see a much higher uh, conformity rate. So you know the different approaches from different countries do, do have a different impact. But something that I wanted to ask about. Um, is in terms of that sense of travel, because we obviously are, you know, an island and there's an ability to be able to try and control things on an island. I was wondering if there's any comparison to, for example, um, Professor, in Germany, where you have borders. I mean, do you have very strict borders that people can't move back and forward? Or is it a case parts of Europe people can freely move back and forward? And, and what is the impact on that on numbers? And then also just the issue of the 14-day quarantine, because... Many in the travel industry, the travel industry has been decimated because, you know, for example, in, in, in the colder northern European countries, it's about travel to the southern European countries. So uh, the travel industry has been completely ruined. And a lot of that is based on the fact that when you return, you must quarantine for 14 days. Is there, has there ever been an assessment done of how many people show their symptoms within day one, day three, day five, and day 14, how many people at the end 
of a quarantine period are actually showing symptoms because again it's anecdotal but i may have heard a figure of like it's only five percent that are actually displaying symptoms much towards the end of the quarantine period and therefore is the 14 days something that's realistic thank you thank you okay. yeah go across the panel there Okay, um, first about the first question. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting um, point for discussion. Um, um, con I think you on the island of Ireland, uh, you're very fortunate because you have, uh, it is not easy to, to cross borders, um, uh, at least to get onto the island. So it's very different in Germany. Uh, we are trying and um, more so with the recent developments um, for, uh, have yeah, try, um, have clear restrictions for people who travel outside to a high risk country. For example, uh, currently lots of discussions in the South is that people might go on skiing vacation uh, to Austria, but uh, clearly the regulations at the moment are that, um, that uh, people then have to go under quarantine for, for 10 days actually. So in a way it is strongly um, um, this um, demo and there, the government is trying to demotivate people to cross borders at the moment. Um, and um, um, uh, concerning your second question, you're absolutely right. The, um, uh, the incubation period for um, co uh, COVID disease is reported up to 14 days, but the majority certainly in the beginning, um, people who develop uh, symptoms are in the first seven to ten days um, so the, the later to the end the less uh, people will probably develop symptoms but on the, the other hand it would be uh, one has to take into account that not everybody will develop disease the younger ones have less symptoms uh, uh, less symptoms anyway even if they're infected or probably even infectious so therefore a policy of combining the length or maybe a shorter length of, uh, of um, uh, quarantine um, uh, combined with a, uh, with a test at the end. So to see whether somebody is, uh, is infected and infectious uh, can, can by, um, for sure reduce the, the time of quarantine. Thank you. Uh, any other panel members want to contribute on those items? Yes, uh, Professor Schrader, please. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll just come in on the travel issue. I think that the reason what we've done in the UK with the 14 day quarantine is taken all the costs of aviation collapsing without any of the benefits because the 14 day quarantine isn't actually enforced. And what you have seen is business traffic, business travel collapse, and probably people who are more risk averse not traveling. And those who are in younger age groups, probably the virus won't affect them as much, going off to places which become hotspots of the virus and then returning. And those people are probably least likely to abide by restrictions when they came back. They came back in the summer to places where pubs and restaurants and house parties were open. And in a way, created the perfect storm where you're not getting the public health benefit of actually having a properly enforced quarantine, but you're taking the cost of aviation collapsing anyways. And I think if we look at what parts of the world are actually getting aviation going, which is probably your trickiest part of this puzzle, um, again, it's East Asia. And how are they doing it? Well, they first dealt with their public health problem. Then they got their domestic economy. And then they set up travel bubbles with testing at airports and with quarantine procedures. So Hong Kong and Singapore have a travel bubble. Australia and New Zealand are having a travel bubble. Um, you know, South Korea I and mean, some of the busiest air routes are now in East Asia, actually, in terms of passenger traffic, because they're using test procedures. Um, so in a way, the inverse of what we're doing. So I think actually, this is one of the, again, mistakes, which was that in the summer, there was the idea we had to give a huge boost to hospitality, a huge boost to aviation, because they were struggling without a longer term plan of actually what's going to happen in the winter when all pubs and restaurants have to shut for months. What's going to happen in the winter when aviation's collapse because people don't want to fly and businesses aren't going to force them. And that's why I think comes back to the zero COVID strategy that clearing the virus and then setting up bubbles and travel routes, which are generally safe, and then having testing used as supportive measures. Okay, thank you. Colin, anything else there? Just, uh, I know it's more difficult for members on the phone to kind of interact at times. Is there anything else, Colin? No, that's great. Sure, thank you very much. Thank you to the panel for the answers. Thank you. Okay, and did Pat, did I see your hand temporarily raised there? Were you looking back in, Pat? 
Yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, I was just a quick question for uh, uh, Professor Ranches. Um, he mentioned earlier about the use of, uh, I think he said, UV light to kill the virus. Could you elaborate on that a bit, please? Sure. Um, UVC light normally uh, eliminates viruses, uh, and in um, more and more, um, it's it's coming out of the testing phase. It's now applied in various places as well. That you uh, because of the the aerosols in the air to to eliminate them, you can either filter or you can have clear uh, UV C light, which which can eliminate some of those. Uh, uh, viruses in the air, so you reduce the uh, the virus load in the air in in rooms. So th that's that's an, a cost effective alternative to extreme um, to to better uh, ventilation and air filtering. It's seen as a sort of air filtering. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and Jonathan, Jonathan Buckley, yep. go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, th these questions are probably to Professor Majid, but if any other panel uh, want to contribute, fair enough. Uh, how common in countries other than South Korea are, are positive pressure testing booths, which allowed greater efficiency in testing in, in South Korea? And how, how does South Korea use the personal data for enforcement purposes, and has that encouraged greater compliance? Uh, so firstly, uh, with the positive testing booths, that, those were developed in South Korea as a way of trying to speed up the testing process. Uh, so rather than having to wear PPE for each different um, person you test, the, the tester just changes their gloves yeah. inside these testing booths. As far as I'm aware, they may localize to South Korea, so I'm not sure if they've been spread across the, the world, although it seem like, it's, they seem a great idea, but I'm, I'm not, I, they seem to have been largely confined to South Korea. Um, you know, I think going forward is something that we should consider in the UK, because uh, these testing booths do protect the tester and allow the testing process to be done much more quickly uh, and more cheaply as well, because you don't have to have all the PPE requirements you would need for a standard test. Um, in terms of isolation, uh, the government of South Korea does fund people to isolate, so they do pay a reasonable amount of money, and that and that is checked upon by mobile phone records and, and other data sources. So I think, as um, Debbie mentioned, uh, they do have more access to data there than we would have in European countries. I expect here that wouldn't be allowed in, in, the, in, in the UK or EU because of the requirements of things like GPDR, but in South Korea, the government does have access to much more data on individuals uh, than governments in, in, in Western European countries, for example. Okay, okay so just a follow-up to that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, one of your articles highlights the need to build additional capacity alongside a, a vaccine programme to prevent delay or displacement from other work. It's something we as a committee are certainly uh, very interested in and concerned about as we move to this next stage. How can, can this be achieved if staffing pressures, as has been outlined by our own health minister, are at such difficult levels? Um, how are other countries maintaining routine services? Yeah. Uh, so it's a good, good question. I, I, I know from speaking to colleagues in Northern Ireland, there are a lot of pressures there on the health system because of a lack of um, key workers such as doctors, etc., nurses. Um, and there are very long waiting times for healthcare in Northern Ireland. Uh, in places like um, China, for example, they created separate hospitals for um, people with COVID-19, so they were, they were then separated from other patients. Uh, they also used hotels a lot more to isolate people, uh, and so by doing that, they were able to protect routine health services and avoid some problems that we've seen in the UK with large increases in people waiting for healthcare uh, across all our four, four uh, UK countries. So it's not just Northern Ireland, but it's also the England, Wales, Scotland as well. Uh, so that was one key lesson to really separate out uh, it's, um, uh, people with COVID from, from other patients by building separate facilities. The second was early adoption of highly effective PPE. So in China, they adopted PPE very early on, and so minimized infection uh, between patients and, and, uh, and staff. In the UK, we were quite slow with PPE, and early on, there was a lot of uh, infection between patients and, and staff in the NHS and also then into nursing homes and care homes as well, which had a, a major impact on, on their residents. So I think there are lessons to be drawn um, from elsewhere. In terms of vaccination, um, we can train staff to be vaccine administrators. So obviously you need some skills to do that, but you don't need a medical degree or a nursing degree. So we could train, for example, medical students, uh, science students, uh, other people as well to act as vaccine uh, administrators in, 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 quite, in a quite short time scale. I think we do need to roll the vaccine program out very quickly 
so we attain high levels of immunity as soon as possible, um, which means investing in, in staffing to do that without the, taking staff away from other key areas of the health service so that we don't then increase waiting times for other other, acts, other services, such as uh, uh, GPs, hospital care, et cetera, cancer care, uh, heart care, and so on. So there are ways, I think, of, think of doing that. It, this is quite new. So no one's yet got a vaccine program in place. Uh, so it looks like the UK will be first lo along with Russia to have its vaccine uh, rolled out. But we, but we need to think about carefully about how we uh, train other people to give vaccines so we don't then uh, use very scarce health professionals to take on this, this role. In, in Northern Ireland, we're, we're being told uh, from from those medical experts that are putting together the vaccination programme that the workforce appeal has been largely within an internal trawl within the health service. And while I, I do recognise the need for uh, administrators, uh, as you have mentioned, uh, that are critical in, in training up staff to do this large vaccine programme, uh, but is that the same approach being followed across the United Kingdom, or is um, there other agencies so that have been brought in? It does vary. So in, in where I work in London, we are looking to use, for example, medical students to give the vaccine. So we're going to give them the training they need, which will probably take more, more than one or two days, and then get them involved in, in giving vaccines. Uh, they will be paid for that role. Uh, we have got you know, a lot of students in, in, in medical schools across the UK. Uh, we have nursing students. We have a lot of students in physiotherapy and other, other health courses. So we plan to use uh, a lot of these students uh, locally to deliver vaccines. Yep, thank you. Yeah, and Arlea. Flynn, go ahead, Orlea. Yes, thanks very much um, to the panel for your presentations. In, um, in one of the articles in our papers, um, it was the one that was specifically around the vaccinations, um, and it had mentioned about, um, sorry, I've just lost it in my pack here, but it had mentioned about the amount of funding um, that had went towards um, the COVID pandemic. Um, particularly around the uh, the contact tracing and the PPE and stuff. Um, and it had mentioned that in comparison to what was has been invested into COVID-19 um, at present, in comparison, um, the amount of money, the funding for the vaccine is substantially less than that. Um, and there was a line in it saying that, you know, that the, the government should be clear on um, you know what funding is required to roll out the vaccine and to ensure that the vaccine is rolled out as rapidly as possible. So my question is, um, could the funding for the vaccine become an issue and how quick we roll it out? Or is it the availability of a vaccine that would be more of the, the problem if someone could just maybe comment on that? Um, so I think that was in my article. So in terms of funding in England, uh, which I'm most familiar with, uh, test and trace has cost about £20 billion. Pounds. This, this year, which is a colossal sum of money. In comparison, GP, for example, are given about £150 million for COVID, COVID preparations. So that's about, you know, that's barely 1% of the amount spent on um, on test and trace this year. So that gives an indication of how much has gone in test and trace versus supporting the health service in terms of preparing for for um, uh, for, for, for COVID. Um, so so I think we do need to look at the, this vaccine program and treat it as a national priority and really invest whatever it takes to get the program done uh, very quickly and implemented very quickly. Uh, there is an issue around the vaccines, so I think, as you mentioned, um, uh, the supply of vaccines is a key, is a key issue. Uh, currently, only, only one vaccine is licensed in the UK, and we'll have uh, only a modest amount of that available before um, before Christmas. Um, so there'll be an issue around getting vaccines on the scale we need to administer them to the population uh, that's at risk, so that will take uh, some time. I think longer term, um, the right different types of vaccines, and the one, one that's been licensed is known as a MRA, mRNA vaccine. That vaccine is not very stable and hard to use in, in wider healthcare settings. I think longer term, we may have to rely on other vaccines that are more stable at, at uh, higher temperatures uh, to, to deliver our vaccine program. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going now across to Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Just uh, if I could ask the panel uh, a very general question. Was a second surge across Europe uh, inevitable? And does the panel think it is important that politicians try to follow the formal medical and scientific advice given to them in fighting this pandemic? Yeah, across to our panel, please. Uh, Professor Schrader, yeah, go ahead, and then I'll come to you, Professor Wrenches. Yep. 
So the second part, um, having now worked with different advisory groups across the world, there is a clear difference between what are scientific questions and what are political questions around priorities. Um, I think schools are a really important one because you have to balance the harms of children being out of school, vulnerable children, working parents with the evidence on children and transmission within educational settings, as well as bringing in um, unions and teachers' interests as well. So I think, yes, it's important to be aware and cognizant of the latest scientific advice, but in the end, the real decisions here are political because there's no right or wrong answers. There's choices and trade-offs and politicians have to take them on behalf of their populations. And all scientific advisory can, can do is lay out the options and the costs and the benefits of each and kind of leave it there. And um, I don't envy any of the people who have to make decisions on these. Um, on the first, was it inevitable? I think every country is seeing resurgences. The question is how big is your bump? Is it a wave? Is it a tiny bump? Is it a flare up? The smaller it is, the easier it is to put it out. It's like a analogy would be fire. And so was it inevitable we would see a rise in cases in the winter? I think every country in Europe seeing it. And to be fair, every country across the world, even East Asian countries, are, it's not like it's flat. You do see the little bumps, but they're tiny bumps. Their bumps won't even register in terms of the scales that we have for our number of cases. But I think the choices we made in the summer put us on this path. Um, and that just comes back to the political decisions that were made in the summer to keep things open, to keep movement going. The same decisions that we've seen have gone into the hard trade-offs over Christmas and the holiday period of allowing people to mix for five days. That's clearly a political decision. There's no scientific basis to allow people to mix for five days in the middle of a pandemic, except that was a trade-off made to say, okay, we need to give some kind of political leeway at this time. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Professor Rentjes? Yes, I, I, I do agree. Of course, um, a second wave was projected. Where a second wave for um, for a pandemic is, is common, is normal, as we saw in previous uh, pandemics. We saw with the swine flu, the second wave was much bigger than the first wave, exactly what we see now. The magnitude of the second wave uh, though depends very much on the interactions or on the actions which we took and um, therefore um, lots of lots of my colleagues um, epidemiologists from all over Europe would have wished we would have um, taken after the first wave taken the measures uh, a bit longer a bit more serious uh, um, it, coming going into the summer and uh, not ignoring um, the pandemic, uh, the, the situation in the summer while the numbers were low. We could have gotten them lower and we could have uh, easily uh, gotten in a, uh, into the second wave in a better position in, in many European countries, I think. But uh, as uh, Devi also pointed out, it's a political and societal decision. And it was a societal decision that people were talking, um, talking about in the past about the pandemic and during the corona pandemic it was like this I, I heard many people talk in the summer and actually um, not realizing that we were still in the beginning of, of, of the whole uh, process so uh, and as other countries have shown us we would we um, in Southeast Asia for example we it's not unavoidable that we would have uh, have to have this high death toll at the moment. Um, and about the second question, I can also only add, uh, agree with Devi also, yes, it is, a, a, at the end of the day, it is a political decision. There are lots of different scientific aspects which uh, need to be taken into account. It's a multidisciplinary thing from a, from a public, from an epidemiological point of view, as an epidemiologist, I have got definitely um, strong points for some parts, but also the uh, sociologists and uh, and also political um, 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 aspects uh, have to play a role. So at the end of the day, uh, decision makers, polit politicians have to take, uh, uh, take decisions, but one has to, what we need is a strategy. Where do we want to get? And this needs to be clear. Do we want to just model through uh, until uh, the summer? Or do we want to control a bit more? Or do we want to let go? And, um, and um, my advice as epidemiologist is, I would also prefer um, 
uh, the elimination uh, uh, something coming closer to an elimination strategy or at least to have a strong strategy to control and my my wish for you on a, a wonderful setting the islands of Ireland uh, where where you have the opportunity um, uh, it would be great if you could uh, could make a benefit of of your geographical position thank you professor and, and i suppose that uh, that does lead on to another question and we have similar in the summer to where we had very very low cases here at the time when we wrote to the minister there actually were low cases in the south of the island as well and um they were they were quite a uh, quite quite in sync with each other at that point in time we have seen in recent months where that has got out of out of a uh, and and we have seen where we have you know cross border or we have we have a uh, issues arising with with the sharing of data we do have a memorandum of understanding in place however it appears that it hasn't dealt with all of the issues that we need to deal with so recognizing that we are a single epidemiological unit we're a very very integrated society in terms of social life and interactions and even caring and, and health needs back and forward across the island we also have uh, extremely integrated business systems and as we know um, in terms of when we've touched upon the mink issue and, the, and the, the the natural world and the animal world we are a single island what are the sort of things that we would need to be building upon in terms of cooperation north and south to make a real difference in how we deal with this virus moving forward Yeah, I'll go to Professor Schreeder, maybe first. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I think we have to work to cooperate across borders. I mean, if Germany wants to go for elimination, it has nine countries it needs to be on the phone with, and each of those has countries it needs to be in touch with, because otherwise it's, it's a bit pointless. And it's amazing that the African Union recognized this very early on and started coordination around their borders because they knew this from their efforts to eliminate malaria or whether it was their polio efforts. They were so used with infectious diseases that you had to cooperate, where I feel like in Europe, that's been one of the very fascinating things that every country is on its own thing without coordinating. So all lockdowns at different points, all kind of had different testing regimes rather than actually coming to some coherence over what are we trying to do with this virus collectively other than just kind of stumble along till a vaccine appears and then hope that solves all our problems. It might be a bit harsh, but that's kind of um, one depiction. What does it mean? I mean, it really means we need leadership from number 10. I really think we need strong leadership from um, at the highest levels from prime ministers and saying that actually this is our strategy and bringing all the stakeholders together and all the different parts of the two islands and saying, how do we reach this together? And what do each of us need to do in a coordinated way to get there? Um, right now, even within the four nations, we have different tier arrangements, different restrictions, um, you know, different uh, timelines. And when you have constant people moving and living and integration, then obviously it's, um, you have to reach coherence. But the first thing to reach coherence on is what are we trying to do? What is the strategy? There is a four nation agreement on maximum suppression, but it's very vague. Um, I think what I would have liked to see is a four nation agreement on an elimination strategy. And what are the steps we each collectively have to put in place to get there and how do we communicate that to the public beyond people thinking it means more lockdowns. Um, and I'll end with this, that the people who are, are most anti-lockdown, it's been frustrating to listen to because those are the people pushing us into lockdown because the act anti-lockdowners are reducing compliance. And when compliance goes and your numbers go up, we are forced into a lockdown because we need those harsher restrictions because our test and trace can't cope. So the irony is the people who are most against restrictions are causing us to go into these restriction cycles. And those of us who are articulating public health principles, good compliance, voluntary behavioral change, trying to keep numbers low, are actually trying to avoid lockdowns at this point. And I think it's become unnecessarily polarized between pro and anti-lockdown instead of actually coherently, we all want to avoid lockdowns. What do we need to do together to, to get there? And a zero COVID strategy is the best way in my view, having looked at this for 10 months. Thank you. Any other panel members in terms of Professor Rentius, in terms of what we can do here better in terms of coordinating the, the response north and south? Yes. Um, yes, exactly. Um, I think for all of us, wherever we are in Europe, it um, makes um, it should be become clearer now that uh, viruses don't respect borders. Uh, whether you're Northern Ireland or Southern Ireland, in, in mainland UK, in Belgium, France, or wherever. And one of the things I think we as 
society have have not done very well is uh, to have a we should have in this situation a common european approach or international global approach even um, we uh, every as debbie also said everybody just cooks their own soup and uh, they, they just every nation uh, starts uh, on their own side but uh, the virus especially i mean in in your situation with north and south of ireland um uh, it, it's it, it's we have this uh, you have the, a very similar problem you you need to work really together actually and not only you we all need to work together much much closer and uh, even uh, even if a country now uh, runs ahead of everybody else with uh, uh, registering a vaccine um, unless as dr tedros always says unless everybody's safe nobody's safe and it doesn't help much if uh, if, if we vaccinate more or you have vaccinate more or we vaccinate more we all need to have uh, people not susceptible anymore for the virus and therefore i i think um, from an outsider point of view i can only highly recommend that uh, you might probably have to take different actions in different parts of the, on the island of Ireland, but not necessarily between the two political different parts, but uh, between the areas with high incidence and low incidence. You might have to uh, weigh your measures, but actually, um, to be realistic, uh, for, for the outside world, it would look very sensible if you would work very close together and really um, you are one island um, in this pandemic whatever whatever political differences there might be but in uh, the virus doesn't care about politics thank you and i see professor majid uh, nodding there professor do you want to say anything on that well, you know i think i would agree with what uh, debbie and ralph have said uh, the border is open between the north and south and so you do have policies that are unified across the two two parts of ireland because uh, the virus does not respect borders, it will cross borders when people cross cross those borders. Okay. Thank you. Listen, panel, I, I really, really want to thank you. I think that has been an absolutely enthralling session, I have to say. There are some very, very interesting foods for, food for thought within that. Um, and I think we could have gone on, I think, for a significant period of time, but I realise you're very busy people, and we deeply appreciate you taking time out of those, out of those busy schedules to... to advise and, and brief and inform us here today and answer our questions. So, Goromila Moyagov, Marshin, from all of us, and I hope you all keep safe, and thank you very much for coming to the committee today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank members. You um, thank you. Thank you. Sure. So, Thanks. Yep, go ahead, Jerry. Sure, just to say, I think it was very useful in terms of the information we got out, and I think, um, not to be too cheeky, but I think some people could learn uh, the way to conduct a panel with uh, succinct, short, and very mm. uh, useful answers. So if that could be conveyed somewhat to um, maybe some people in the department uh, in a serious way, I think that would be very helpful to maybe respond to some of the previous comments raised by Jonathan and others, because we got a lot of information out there, but there were very quick answers. So I think it was a useful panel, and uh, you know, thanks to everybody involved for that. Yeah. yeah, I think it was very useful. Could we agree that we write to, to each of the, the academics and thank them for their time this morning? Um, okay, members, we're going to go back then to our more, uh, our, back to the start, as, for our back to section two of our agenda, but I'm going to take a very short break there. Just uh, could we come back again for 12 uh, to restart? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members, thank you. Uh, moving on then with, with our other business for today. Um, returning to chairperson's business, um, I had advised last week that I had met recently with the Neve Louise Foundation and that um, they work with, with young people principally, but, but also other people um, in, the, in the community who are experiencing severe uh, difficulties in terms of their mental health. And um, a number of their young people had written to us to kind of share with us as a committee 
their feelings, their worries, their fears, their hopes, their dreams, all of that. And I think, uh, I th I think uh, it was very, to me, I think very useful. The letters, I want to know all those young people to know that the letters have been circulated around every member of the committee, and we will see those and read those. I will go through some of, some of the remarks just uh, in terms of today. But I do want those young people and anyone else to know that, that we are listening and we are aware and we are doing all we can in relation to that. But just a, so I'll just read out a couple of them and then I'll go to a few of the members. But uh, just, just picking out an odd, an odd wee comment that I thought struck me. Um, dear Chair of Health Committee, I find school hard because the teachers uh, pressurise too much about schoolwork and sometimes we don't have enough time to finish all our homework and do extra studies. And I think we all probably recognise that. Um, and, and this is a particularly and a uniquely difficult time. Another, another uh, young person had written to ask, will exams happen and if so, when? So I think that lack of certainty around exams, around what's happening, even around what's happening after Christmas, is a worry and a concern and, and something again that we recognise. There were also, throughout the, throughout the letters, there were things that people seen as positive, and I think that's, that's very useful. One person wrote, I don't know whether it was a boy or a girl, but one person wrote to say that they liked learning online. Um, they made a suggestion that at least one or two days a week should be considered making online learning a normal occurrence. And this young person felt that that would reduce pressure and they could work from the comfort of home and more relaxing. So it demonstrates the wide range of views, I think. Um, I'll maybe go to Pam. Pam, was there anything in, the, in those correspondence that you particularly wanted yeah, to mention? Thank you, Chair. And it's really, it's really good that um, these young people have taken the time to write to us. And it's good to see that kind of evidence in front of us. And I'll just quote a few of the um, comments here. Uh, one individual is talking about being, about being upset, angry and annoyed about all the things that we're, that we're most looking forward to have been taken away e.g. formal festivals, holidays and driving. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that those things, they can't be undone, they can't be replaced. You know, so there's things that have been missed, kind of milestones in these young people's lives and we can't take it away from them. And an another comment from another person talks about uh, the strain on friendships and the, um, the effects of being, the effects of the ability of being able to socialise and, and then how that leads to feeling isolated. Um, and another comment about um, the worry about people getting really badly ill from COVID, like family members. So we can't dismiss that, you know, sometimes we can be very glib and think that, you know, the young people think that this virus doesn't affect them and uh, there can be an assumption that, that young people don't care about uh, older, more vulnerable people but quite obviously they do, and they have those same worries and, and um, thoughts that we would have. Um, so I think it's good to recognise that and just recognise how difficult this whole pandemic has been for children and for young people in particular. Because, I mean, we, we remember, especially young people, those are the years you do actually remember in your life. You know, that stays with you throughout your life. So this will have uh, an, an ongoing impact throughout, you know, these um, children and young people's lives going forward and I think it's right that we recognise that and, and I would just like to say thank, to, thank you to each and every one of them for writing to us, it's really important. Thank you. Um, Paula, then Jerry, then Alan. Uh, yeah. Thank you Chairman and, and thanks for really honing in on this and in this meeting. I, I, my mother used to always say you can't put wise head on young shoulders and I think when you read these you remember how like we, we have a lot, we have decades more experience of life and, and sometimes like the um, um, one of them said, a lot of unknown, nobody knows what's going on, increased anxiety, fear and worry. You know, it's very hard for any of us to rationalise what's actually happening right now and how it's going to affect our lives going forward, but especially at the crucial stage when they're doing their GCSEs or A-levels, to just not know what's what's happening next week, let alone next year and stuff. So really appreciated it, and I think it was just very sobering and a great reminder to, to look at the, the fresh words on, on the page. So again, thanks for, for them submitting those. Thank you, Jerry. Chair, sure. similarly, I think you know we want to thank the people who um, made those comments. They're very hard hitting and but important, um, and the uncertainty that they're they're facing. Um, but I think while some of the questions are are complex around COVID, I mean, for me, what stuck out is the exams pressure. Like a lot of these young people are feeling a real um, amount of pressure when they either they're off school or they go into school, um, and they're still forced to effectively go through exams. So I, I hope that that can be. 
Um, the minister can take that on board, the education minister, to you know make sure that they're not forced into exams and they have been off, or with a you know we're in a really tumultuous period. So um, yeah, thanks thanks to the young people for for submitting those um, those comments. Alan, yeah, uh, I I probably have to dig a lot deeper into my memory bank than all you youngsters in the uh, in the room here. Uh, but you know, looking back to my childhood, um, you were very you were sort of insulated from all that was going on around you in the world. You know, I lived through the the Cuba crisis, and when you read about it now, it, it was a big thing, and I'm sure uh, uh, everybody that had a consciousness of it at the time were saw the end of the world coming nearly uh, because of that and things like that. But you were sort of to say your your parents protected you from it. There wasn't social media, there wasn't uh, TV, there wasn't the same exposure to the events of today. But I think today with the, the you know, there is so much availability of, of all that's going on around us on, on uh, either on the internet or TV, radio, whatever. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, it, it, it's an education to see that the children now uh, are aware of what's going on around them and that they, that they are, that they do suffer stress uh, and anxiety from what's going around them. And the letter, I think maybe Pam alluded to it there as well, a young person here saying that there's a lot of uncertainty uh, of the exam process next year and worried about the economy crashing and there have been no jobs and, um, and worried about people getting really ill from COVID, uh, my family members. Uh, and it is it is very sobering to to realise that young people now do share the stresses and strains that uh, adults uh, have at the moment, and uh, we, we need to recognise that and just just be aware of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, anyone else there? And I'll just if if any of the members on the phone want to raise a hand, because I can't see any of the members on the phone at the present time there. Um, but I suppose it is, it is and, and one of these letters finishes off with thank you for reading, and I think that is, that is the key thing, and I think it's, I really appreciate those young people taking the time to write to us in such detail and so honestly. And I do want to say to each and every one of you di directly, and to all young people who at this time are struggling, or indeed anyone else who is struggling, it really is okay to not be okay. And this is a difficult time, and you know, there are huge things going on around you which are which are worrying, so please know that that is, and it's okay, and please talk to someone. Talk to your mummy or your daddy. Speak to one of, your, one of your own family or a teacher or a friend. But if you are feeling that you're struggling, please do speak to someone, and there is help and support out there if, if you can find someone to speak to and tell them how you're feeling. But thank you for now, and uh, we, will, we will take on board the issues that you have raised with us in, these, in this correspondence. So thank you for that. Thank you, members. So we'll move on then. Can I, can, I, can I propose with the re reply thanking the children and Lee Louise for sending those letters to us and giving us a better understanding of the issues they're facing? And let everyone know who's, who's following the committee at this point that we are doing a dedicated session in relation to mental health. We are very concerned about that issue and we're doing a session on that in the new year to focus in some more detail on that. So, and then there was within that correspondence there was also a, a reference to a, a, another a issue around psychological autopsy. If members are content, they can respond individually to that and arrange further information on that themselves. So, moving on then, members, to draft minutes, and I refer you to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 26th of November, which are tab 3.1 of your meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes? Yep, thank you, members. There are two items uh, arising from those, and I refer members to tab four of the pack. Item 4.1 is a briefing paper on the Interdepartmental Working Group on Mother and Baby Homes, Magdalene Laundries, and Historical Clerical Child Abuse that was unfortunately not received until Friday. Item 4.2 is a copy of the Independent Chair's speaking note from last week's briefing that we had asked for, and that was forwarded after the session there for members as well. So are members content to note those? Okay. Yep, thank you. Okay, members, um, moving on then. <coughs> so members, just one item of business at the end of the ministers that I want to touch back on. Uh, the, the Minister's briefing. Are members content to note the departmental correspondence at items 5.1 and 5.2 of your pack? Yes. 
It was included in this section rather than correspondence, but I am content to note. Thank you. Okay, members, so moving on then to um, our consideration now of four statutory rules regarding coronavirus travel restrictions. Um, I refer members there to tab 7 to 10 of your pack. Sorry, um, the officials aren't here until 12.30. So. Okay, okay. I, I had seen Brian there. I wonder, does that mean... Len, Len's not ready. So I'll take a short break there just to, just to check, and we may need to come back to correspondence or another item and then return to this. Um, but I'll take a short break just to check. Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Okay, members. So. Uh, our members content then that while we're getting those officials on the line, hopefully for 12.30, that we move to correspondence? Yep. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Thank you, members. Turning then to correspondence, uh, can I refer members to the correspondence at tab 11 of your pack, uh, the correspondence memo at tab 11.1, and to tab 11 of your table papers. Um, so there's a number of items there that I would like to draw your attention to, members. Item 11.10 is from a GP concerning waiting times. Do members have any comments they wish to make in relation to that item? Sorry, could you repeat which um, item is it? Sorry. Uh, it's 11.10. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's 11.10 there. So I was going to suggest maybe that we reply to the GP advising that the committee shares her concerns, and indeed those concerns have been raised, and we have scheduled a briefing with the department on that matter in the new year. Mm. Would members be content with that approach? Yeah. Chair, could, could we also um, forward uh, that letter to the minister for his views as well? I mean, yeah. I, th I think, I mean, ideally, I know this committee is under extreme pressure, but I, mean, I think ideally you'd be wanting to look at, you know, some kind of mini or micro inquiry into the whole, that whole side of things. And I, I don't know if that would be possible at some stage, but I think it, it is a very serious issue, and we know there's going to be an absolute avalanche of problems falling in behind us. Um, so I yeah. certainly would like to see that going to the Minister, at least for his commentary. Yeah, we're content to say that we have a, fo a forward planning day arranged in the new year at which we can consider how what, what how we prioritise our time going forward. Go ahead, Paula. Well, it's just the one of the paragraphs there related to um, the devastation felt by couples waiting for fertility treatment. And I suppose if we're asking the Minister um, to respond, if we could have some specifics around around that issue, because we've all been contacted by constituents yeah. around that issue. Yeah. Okay, thank you, members. Um, 11.14 then, item 11.14 in your pack, members, is from the Society of St Vincent de Paul, highlighting the increase in poverty due to the impact of COVID-19. Um, have members any comments they wish to make in general on, in that correspondence? Jonathan. No, I, I just I just feel that it should be ca copied on to the health minister. You know, it, it obviously is worrying reading. I suppose probably the uptake, etc. Like 66 percent increase in requests for support month on month. You know, it's it's right across the board that we're hearing this. So I think it would be important to draw that to the minister's attention, not to that specific correspondence. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jerry. Sure. Thanks. Just on that, I think it's important. Um, I think the letter stated that uh, the increase in poverty is, is in existence whilst the job retention scheme is still in place. The fear is that um, when the job retention scheme ends, if it does, you know, people will be further pushed off the cliff. So I think it's important just to recognise that. And, and also I was um, doing some work yesterday with the uh, North Belfast Advice Partnership and the People's Kitchen. They're doing some tremendous work. And as are many organisations out there to, I think, uh, fill the gap when, when governments haven't. So it's uh, it's quite worrying, but I think we need to keep a focus on it. It is a health issue, obviously, and it has an overlap with poverty and health and all those associated um, uh, issues. Yep, thank you. Colin? Yeah, sorry, 
remember the remarks that are made. Is there any way that we could um, write? I think it might be the executive office actually, but um, that we wrote to the first and deputy first minister and asked for an update on the anti-poverty strategy, which was contained in the NDNA um, as a commitment that it would be delivered. Because I don't think there's ever been a time that we would need um, a coherent and useful. Uh, anti-poverty strategy, but I wouldn't like to think that that's been delayed because of COVID. It's something that we desperately need, and maybe copying that letter may um, spike the, the the need for it. Yeah, members content with that. Yeah. And also, I, I was very deeply struck, as I know other members were, of the Spotlight programme a few weeks ago, and there was, I think, a member of the Royal College of Children's Paediatric Health um, had stated about children putting toast into their nappies because they might not get any. And that struck me to my core, I have to say. I actually felt ashamed in, in some degree, but I certainly felt a sense of urgency. Um, and, and I know that the committee has uh, outlined that this is a key issue for us and one that we are, want to return to in the, in the new year. So would members be content to acknowledge that it's an area of concern for the committee? Uh, also, that we also share that concern and advise that we will be looking at health inequalities in the new year and maybe invite maybe RCPCH mm -hmm. as part of that session to to uh, you know drill into that yep. that statement that was made because I think it is something that we absolutely need to address and play our part in addressing. Okay, thank you, members. Item 11.16 then is from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists regarding the provision of abortion services. Have members any comments in relation to that? Um, would members be content that we advise the Royal College of previous committee correspondents and intention, and, and indeed committee's previous look at that, and the intention to return to that subject, and also that we forward this correspondence to the department and the executive for urgent consideration? And uh, well, I, I'm happy to, to certainly uh, uh, very much support your suggestion there. But if they even sent it individually to members, then I'd be happy to follow up with the minister even three questions as well. So I haven't seen a copy of that letter at my point. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's at eleven point one six. So oh, okay, so, members. Yeah. Okay, members okay, content. Got it, sorry. Moving on then to item 11.17 is from the Gillen Review Implementation Team at the Department of Justice, refer referencing the recommendation for relationships and sexuality education in schools and the wider Gillen Serious Sexual Offences Report recommendations. That's at item 11.17 of the pack there, members. Um, are members content to note that report? Yep, yep. members content, thank you. Item 11.18 is a call for evidence from the Committee for Justice on the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill by the 15th of January. Um, have members any comments to make in relation to that? Or are members content to note? Yeah, content to note, thank you. So members, moving on, uh, members, if there's any further comments or proposals on any of the other correspondence there in that main pack before I go on to table papers today, if members want to raise, no indication. So members, otherwise content with the actions proposed there on your correspondence memo? Yep, thank you, members. Moving on then to table papers, there are two other items of additional correspondence in our table pack this week. So item 11.22 is the 33rd report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules. Um, are members content to note the report? Yep, thank you, members. Item 11.23 is a proposed joint letter from the chairs of the Committee for the Economy, Communities, the Executive Office and Health to the First and Deputy First Ministers in relation to the mental health and welfare of students in higher education. Um, and I, I did, I did do. A, there was a joint meeting this week in relation to that issue and in relation to supports for that. But would members be content for me to sign this on behalf of the committee? Um, and do members wish, to, or do members indeed wish to take a moment to read it? There, I'm conscious that members may not. It's in table papers. It's 11.23. Do members want to take a minute just to have a look at that and see if you're content for me to sign that on your behalf? Table papers, sure, yeah. Yeah, table papers, 11.23. Colin, go ahead. You have your hand raised there. Do you wish to make a point on that? 
Sorry, Chair, it's still up from earlier, but I'm happy to support the letter as, a, as we did at our committee yesterday. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. And other members content to support the letter? Okay. Thank, thank you, members. So, um, members, we will now be returning to the SRs, but we do need to get the, the, the uh, officials online. They had been advised that it was probably around 12.30, so I'll take a quick, a short break there, and we'll return at 12.30 for that session. Are we going to do any other business after then? We, yeah, we could do any other business now, actually. We could do any other business now. I yeah. just wanted to raise the issue of the, um, I think it's a private members' bill in, in, in the south, uh, around the dying with dignity. Um, I think maybe MLAs have been contacted by um, some pe um, palliative um, doctors here um, who are concerned that section, sa section 7 of it um, relates to the, or references the island of Ireland. Um, obviously, we're not going to take a position on um, assisted dying here at committee, but obviously there is potential if it goes further than the pre-scrutiny stage that it's at or consideration stage um, um, that it might have implications for, for Northern Ireland. So I'm just wondering if we could write to the Department of Health to see how they're interacting with the South in terms of um, the potential implication if the legislation goes forward. I think it's the Department of, uh, the, sorry, the Justice Committee are looking at it or doing the scrutiny in the South, but it, uh, obviously it's health, but um, it's just to see what the Department of Health here are doing around engagement. Uh, go to Jerry and then Jonathan. Yeah, my colleague, uh, Gino Kenny, he's bringing the, forward the, the, the PMB, and I had a brief conversation with him about the, the northern sort of aspect of it, but my understanding, Paul, is that there hasn't been any engagement uh, between uh, him or the team with the DOH in regards to the bill. Now, there could have well have been since I last spoke to him, but my understanding is there hasn't been any conversation. But the bill, obviously, if it proceeds, as you say, it will have uh, ramifications where people in the north could get access to services in the south, as far as I understand it. But I think there needs to be a bit of, bit of clarity on that. Yeah, OK. And indeed, it may fall It may fall within just... But I think if we got that update, it might inform our... our I'll go to Jonathan, then sure. I'll come back. Th on. Thanks, Chair. And no, I also, along with, with Pam, have met with those clinicians and, and I suppose probably those palliative care professionals. And I suppose probably, to put on record, my concerns equally as to uh, the nature of the bill, um, particular concerns on both fronts. Yes, I, I do understand that it, it, there's a great deal of overlap between justice and health given, number one, the way in which the bill has been uh, brought forward in terms of its content constitutionally and the, implica and the implications that way, that causes some concern. Um, but equally, also from a health point of view, the concern as to the status of people living within Northern Ireland uh, and their ability to access such services if it passed, uh, I suppose it runs deeply against my grain, in particular from the point of view that... Um, I'm in the business of trying to save lives. Uh, so I suppose probably um, putting on record the deep concerns that I would have, uh, I, I think first and foremost what we need to do is some research as to what engagement has been had from a ministerial point of view as well with the health minister and maybe indeed the justice minister as to um, what level of engagement there has been or has not been to, the, to, to, to date. But I would imagine now that it's go I think it's going to Scrutiny committee scrutiny stage, I think it's at. I would imagine that some of these details in which have been flagged to us with concern uh, will probably start to get further traction, and I suppose it would be good for, for us to be proactive in relation to how it affects Northern Ireland in particular. Uh, Paula and then Pam. Just a quick question. It's really about you know, what jurisdiction do we have to make a submission to their committee? I mean, obviously this is quite new to, to me as a health committee member, so even just from our own point of view as to what we can do either as party members or as a health committee to actually contribute to that process would, would be useful, a bit of clarity. Thank yeah. you. Okay, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll explore that, Pam. Yeah, and also I concur with um, my colleague Johnny's comments there. But I'd also like to know um, if there, if there's any um, precedence for actually having legislation from another country which actually impacts on, on Northern Ireland. You know whether that's ever happened or or that description of Ireland, of Ireland, if that has been included in any other legislation um, in the Republic. I'd like to. That we uh, get a bit more information around that as well, but obviously the meetings we had with clinicians where they were uh, incredibly concerned that would be putting it mildly uh, around it, and they were um, very uh, very concerned going forward that this was not um, 
you know, certainly they didn't see it as a, a role for a, a clinician to assist in, in dying. So I, I think they, they were very worried about the impact um, in terms of the palliative care that they give uh, and the whole ethos of, of the very good work that they do day and daily. So they were very concerned. Yeah, and um, it, it did strike me during the discussion that, that we are also seeing the, the potential for overlap in terms of the mother and baby homes. Obviously, that is an issue also that impacts across the, the uh, entire island of Ireland. Um, so we, I think in the, in the first instance, we should write and ask for an update from the department, and then we can decide how then we best approach it. Is there potential maybe to look at, uh, uh, explore how, how we might interact in terms of information with committees in the... Yeah, I'll certainly um, seek some advice on that and talk to colleagues and raise or legal about what other advice we might be able to get for you. But from a sort of preliminary standpoint, you can write to whomever you wish to write to. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. What they do is another matter. Okay. <laughs> sure, could, could I maybe also suggest that you write to um, the Chair of the Justice Committee as well, flagging this up with him, given that there will be a significant overlap, making him aware yeah. of, of the issue that has been raised? Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Okay, members, thank you. Um, we can actually, members, also move on with um, the forward work programme there, and maybe we'll have no need of a break at all. So, uh, if we go return there to item 12, forward work programme. So, I refer you all to the draft forward work programme at 12.1 of your pack there. Um, so, are members content to, content to seek a written briefing on, ja in, on January monitoring in order to make time for the briefing from the Trust Chief Executives on the 17th of December, um, which we agreed, we agreed to look for that Trust meeting, but we need to make space for it, and making space at this point involves moving and juggling things around. So would members be content to seek a written briefing on January, January monitoring to make space for the Trust? Yeah. I'm concerned, um, Chair, the last time I think we had three of the Trust um, Chief Executives here, and it was a very crammed session, so are, are you suggesting that we have all five to one? No. No. I can confirm three have confirmed. Okay. We have the Northern, the Belfast Trust and the Southern Trust, um, because we recognise five is too many, so we looked at geographic spread, high incidence, and who hadn't been before you. Yeah, okay. That's Just that even three seems quite a lot, but if we can give enough to the agenda time wise, we appreciate it. Yep. Okay, and are members otherwise content then to note the forward work programme? Okay, thank you, members. Moving on then to there was one other um, additional SR, which was in table papers, I believe, Clark, was it? Yeah, um, okay, well, so we. We can go to that session now. Okay. We can return then to the SRs. We do have Elaine on the line and Brian on the line, so we can return to those SRs that we had, um, the, the, four, the four that were included on the main pack. So, um, so we're now... Uh, are, are, these, these are contained within a page from tab 7 to tab 10 of your pack, and there's a clerk's memo in relation to these at tab 7.1. All four of these SRs are subject to negative resolution. The examiner for statutory rules has reported that each of these SRs is in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content with the department's reason for the breach and has no other comments to make in regard to the regulations. I can advise members that uh, officials are here today to brief the committee on the regulations and to take questions, and then we will, as normal, consider each SR in turn. So I'd now like to welcome to our meeting this morning um, on video conferencing, Ms Elaine Colgan, who is Chief of Staff to the Chief Medical Officer, and Mr Brian Dooley, who is Head of Health Improvement Policy Branch within the Department. So I'd like to invite you now, Elaine and Brian, to go ahead uh, with your briefing, please. Whichever of you are leading this morning, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll start with an update on the amendments. So statutory rule 254 amends the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Regulations 2020. This added to the exempt countries, um, Bahrain, Cambodia, Chile, Iceland, Laos, Qatar, Turks and Caicos Islands and the United Arab Emirates. It also removed from the exemption exempted countries Greece 
except for the islands of Corfu, Kos, Crete, Rhodes and Zykonthos, and the sovereign base areas of Akrotiri and Dekelia in Cyprus were also removed. Um, these came into effect at 4 a.m. on Saturday the 14th of November. Statutory Rule 275 came into effect on 4 a.m. Saturday the 21st of November, and these regulations added a number of countries to the travel corridor following a reduced risk assessment. Bonaire, St. Eustatius, St. Sabah, Israel, Jerusalem, Namibia, the Northern Mariana Islands, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Uruguay, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. These regulations also updated the list of exemptions relating to sporting events. They omitted 12 events and inserted eight. Um, an example of the events concerned would be snooker and darts tournaments. Statutory Rule 278, Amendment 23, which came into force on Tuesday the 24th of November, these regulations amend the Health Protection International Travel Regs and, the mis and amend the list of exemptions in Schedule 2, which specifies persons who are exempt from the requirement to self-isolate. So in relation to subsea engineers, the regulation extends the existing exemption to routine maintenance. Previously, it only covered emergency work. A small number of people are involved, so this was a pra pragmatic exemption. It also includes the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, formerly known as the Foreign Office Amendments, in relation to the exemption for Crown servants or government contractors that brought in the scope to include more staff and includes those returning to the UK where necessary to facilitate the functioning of a diplomatic mission. So previously it had been simply essential government work. The Second Amendment makes it clear that individuals conducting state business overseas are exempt when certified as such by a government department whether or not they are Crown servants or government contractors is currently defined. The last amendment, Statutory Rule 261, the Health Protection Coronavirus Travel from Denmark regulations came into effect on Wednesday the 18th of November. And as the committee are aware, owing to emerging evidence from Danish health authorities, reports of widespread outbreaks of COVID-19 in mink farms, with subsequent spread of a mink variant virus to the local community, the Department of Health made regulations to prohibit the arrival in Northern Ireland of vessels and aircraft travelling directly from Denmark on the 10th of November. These amending regulations subsequently amend the principal regulations to provide the maximum fine on summary conviction of £10,000. This is in line with fines imposed on operators. These regulations came into effect on the 18th of November. COVID-19 mink variant the problem in Denmark has since receded, with Danish health authorities now considering the cluster 5 variant is likely extinct. Along with widespread testing of the population in affected areas of Denmark, this has led to scientific experts advising that the travel ban on Denmark should be lifted. These regulations were therefore revoked with effect from the 28th of November. That concludes my update in relation to those amendments, Chair. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, um, and we had we had sent you a number of, I suppose, additional questions there, and uh, in really we're, we're we're awaiting an answer on those. But is there? We had asked for an update on the work to monitor compliance with post-travel self-isolation, and we have heard at an earlier session from some of our international or panel around the benefit and the actually the necessity of good monitoring and compliance and support in terms of the isolation part of it. So can you give us any update, Brian or Elaine, on uh, how that monitoring process is being, and support process is being conducted? Um, well, in relation here to international arrivals, data from passenger locator forms is subject to a data sharing agreement between Border Force and Public Health England. So spot checks are carried out on those who should be self-isolating via tele phone calls by a contractor. Where con can contact cannot be made, so over three calls on consecutive days followed by a text message, or if there's a concern that an individual is not self-isolating, border forces are advised. And the police then take forward any necessary compliance visits and any further action required. So police figures show that as of the 27th of November, there were four, 49 
fixed penalty notice had been issued in relation to failure to self-isolate after international travel. Um, and I could also advise further to that, I think you referred in a previous meeting to a uh, an, an incident in relation to a, an international traveller that was isolating in a hotel who was asked to leave the hotel. And we can advise that where people are in that situation and they're considered destitute, there are arrangements for accommodation and transport to be provided by Border Force through an agreed process. And once that individual leaves the point of entry and they are in the country concerned, the police are then able to provide similar support. Um, Border Force in Northern Ireland are only aware of one such approach at the point of entry and accommodation was supplied. Uh, the police report that four people have availed of the service through that route and accommodation was provided. Okay, thank you. And we have also heard earlier in relation to the the uh, at least indications that there's some success in relation to dealing with that mink variation variant outbreak in Denmark. And I think actually it was it was uh, a salutary lesson that critical to that was the speed and the completeness with which the authorities moved in relation to that. And I think that's a lesson for for wider for wider learning. But can you give us any update on whether there is any evidence at this point in time of that mink variant uh, emerging here on the island of Ireland? Yes, I, I can advise you that I've been advised that there is no incidence of that mink variant in Northern Ireland or in the Republic of Ireland. Okay. And finally, for me, before I go to members then, um, Brian or Elaine, we had asked about uh, the availability of minutes to see what type of issues were being discussed to try to get a better understanding of the decision-making process. And I know you've mentioned there this morning um, snooker and darts competitions, and I'm just not, well, I'm not aware, like I'm, I, I, and I, may, I stand to be corrected, but I'm not aware of any major snooker or darts competitions. And there does be this kind of thing at times where some of the regulations don't seem very relevant in some ways in, in particular. So can you advise how, how you apply additional maybe things that are of concern here into those regulations or how, how you're assessing the, their relevance to here rather than just taking them across just because they've been made elsewhere? Well, I'll, I'll make a start on that. Elaine's had more experience over the last few months, but um, for example, in relation to the sporting events, we do confer with Department for the Communities in Northern Ireland. So we do try and make an attempt, make them as relevant as we can to Northern Ireland. Um, I don't know, Elaine, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, uh, thanks, Brian. Um, just in relation to sport, it is probably worth saying that we do, we, we do have a tentative agreement with England um, and the other DAs that we will all you, uh, the sporting events that each other has in their jurisdiction. And that's just in case there are people transiting through the region. Um, so whilst I can understand the terrorist point that some of those sporting events won't necessarily seem relevant to Northern Ireland, and to be fair, the chances of anyone transiting through Northern Ireland en route to them is, is very low. Um, but it is just an agreement that we came to whenever we, we, we started the sporting um, events and it, it did work out for us well with the golf tournaments earlier in the year as well so that those got added into England's list. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go down to Pam. Yep, thank you, Chair. Uh, I suppose it's generally worth noting that um, uh, in particular to the, the travel regs here that the majority of the countries that have been added to exemption lists don't actually have direct flights into Northern Ireland. But it, that does, of course, highlight then the ongoing importance of constructive cooperation with the UK government and indeed with Dublin to ensure that travellers know their rights and responsibilities and declare passenger information when it's required. Um, well, my question is uh, more specifically to the £10,000 penalty under the Denmark travel restrictions that's been established. So I wanted to ask how that compares to breaches of other um, COVID offences and if it's proportionate. But I'd also like to know if it's been used yet, if anybody has received a fine. I'll make a start on that. Um, uh, we were advised by DSO who had considered the level of the fine that that would be the appropriate, so it would be not exceeding £10,000, and that was consistent with similar travel restriction fines um, in Northern Ireland and across the UK. Has, has it been used yet? Uh, sorry, um, no, it hasn't been. Okay. Okay, Bob. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to Colin on the phone, and then I'll come back to Jerry here in the room. 
So Colin, are you there, please? Yes, indeed, Chair. Thank you very much, and thanks for the presentation. Um, just two questions. Um, one is the um, the Eng uh, English government have brought in a model of five days of self isolation followed by a positive test to get in sort of to, within England. Just like, is there any um, consideration being given to replicate that for here? And also, then, what is the impact if it's 14 day isolation if you come into Belfast, but if you go into London, it's five days followed by a positive test. Are people able to onward travel to here from London to Belfast? Or if they come to London, then Belfast, do they have to do 14 days? If they stop in London, can they do five days and then come over to Belfast? What's the, what's the guidance there? Can I defer to you, Elaine, because you might be aware of more recent yeah, I'm happy to take that one, um, Brian. So test and release is something we are looking at in Northern Ireland. Um, we Elaine, don't sorry. plan to introduce it. Sorry, Elaine, just sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, it's a wee bit hard to yeah. follow you. If you, just, if you just go as slow as possible, maybe, it's a wee bit unclear. Yeah, sorry, no problem. I'll come closer to the screen to you with my okay. help. Um, so test and release in Northern Ireland is something we're considering actively. Uh, we don't plan to introduce it on the same time scale as England, so it wouldn't be in on the 15th of December here. It would be unlikely to be in by the end of this calendar year. So it would be, if we introduced it, it would be into January, I would imagine, uh, just with the amount of work that would be required at this point. Um, uh, to answer the question about onward travel to Northern Ireland, if you have been released in England, so the England proposals are that the test will take place on day five, but that you wouldn't be released until the negative result came through. So whilst that might, in a few small cases where there's drive-in facilities, enable instant release, for the majority of cases, it will be about 48 hours later when they are able to leave self-isolation. Um, if they were to leave self-isolation, so following the scenario, if a person, say, for example, leaves isolation in England on day seven following a negative test and comes to Northern Ireland, they would need to resume self-isolation until the 14th day because we don't allow for it in our regulations as yet. Okay. Um, in terms, thank, thank you for that. Then in terms of um, travel for the various countries that are then exempt, what type of travel is permitted to those um, places and is how does that conflict with the executive um, suggestion that there should only be essential travel, or, or I think it's going to be phrased, not unnecessary travel. So how, how do those various things stack up against each other? Yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, in terms of the travel regulations, there is no stipulation on your reason for travel, uh, and we don't, we don't give guidance. Um, in, in terms of that, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office issue travel guidance generally to all uh, regions of the UK, which covers Northern Ireland citizens. Um, but in terms of the connection there to the general restrictions, which is what you mentioned, and the, the guidance that you shouldn't undertake unnecessary travel, there is no immediate connection between that and the travel regulations. Could, could I ask you maybe just to unpack that for me? Because I, 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 I get all those words, but I don't, I don't quite understand from that. So does that mean, for example, a family of four could go to... To Crete or Corfu or one of those islands that's taken off and spend a week at Christmas and that's permitted or is it that the executive says you shouldn't undertake unnecessary travel so therefore it's not permitted? So the, 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 the guidance on unnecessary travel isn't as far as I'm aware in regulation so you could legally go away on holiday over Christmas uh, and there's no there's no it's, it's for everyone to decide for themselves what's necessary and not um, so whether they feel travel to the airport is necessary, that would be the only travel within Northern Ireland that would need to be considered in terms of the general restrictions that are in place. But as far as I know, at this point, there's no restriction in law in Northern Ireland to limit travel. It's only guidance. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Jerry. Yeah, thanks. Um, just in terms of the countries and, and the rates, um, I know Iceland is, is quite low in terms of death rates and presumably infection rates, but I'm just looking at a graph for Chile. Um, from June to November uh, 29th, it's shot up the amount of cases. And if I read the regulations correctly, Chile is exempt from uh, 
um, people coming from Chile, sorry, for example, from isolation. So, uh, is the department confident that uh, these countries, in terms of easing the restrictions, uh, there are there are rates, the infection rates uh, aren't uh, dangerously or increasing? I'll, I'll make a start. Um, I know that the PHE and the JBC look at this on a daily basis. So there have been occasions when countries have come off and then gone back on again. So I can understand your concern when rates appear to increase. Or I can say that on a weekly basis, we're looking at this. Right. So, I mean, would the department be confident then that those countries added on to the exemption lists are at a safe level? Uh, they, are, they aren't increasing, they aren't, they aren't at a dangerous level. Uh, would the department be fully confident with that? Yes, we would. We've, we're constantly discussing this with colleagues, um, not only weekly, but even more frequently. And the information, the methodology behind all this has been approved by the CMOs, and the CMOs actually alternately chair the, the group that oversees this on the JBC. So there's a lot of uh, um, discussion and interaction between the various developed administrations in England. And, um, and there's a lot of people behind the scenes who are getting the analysis of the situation. Okay, thank you. Um, Brian or Elaine, I, I, just returning to the mink issue, there was another element to that that I wanted to raise. And given that we have had a very salutary lesson in relation to Denmark about the potential for, for coronavirus, or indeed any other virus, but coronavirus, to mutate or jump into an animal species and return back into humans. Um, and, and we had asked as part of our letter to you, so to, we had asked for further information on how the threat of spread of the virus by animals is assessed. And again, recognising that that single epidemiology across the island, and certainly it's the case that wildlife certainly doesn't respect the border. So how you, you had agreed that you would consult with colleagues on that issue. Can you give us an update on how that issue is being addressed or assessed ongoing? Okay. Well, I can advise that um, DERA in Northern Ireland are looking at this issue, and in our response to you, we will probably advise you to contact them. But I can also say that the analysis of the risk of mutant variants um, amongst different animal species has also been considered as part of the JBC and the PHE analysis. So, um, hopefully, in the response which we'll provide to you in the next week, you'll be able to see that um, clarified. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, Brian, just if I just add to Brian's and a little update on the last couple of days. So the JBC have sensitively included the process this week for the, the assessment of the threat that animal risk spread in, in various countries. Um, and CMOs are considering that in the next week to get that formalised. Uh, so it, it's very near completion as well. Okay, thank you. And I think a final question from Jonathan. I don't see any other indication. Jonathan, thanks. Given the commentary from Leo Varadkar in recent days, where he seemed to cast some form of doubt on travel uh, to Northern Ireland from the Republic, what steps are being taken to engage with Dublin uh, re regarding the science underlying these decisions and indeed the wider health regulations in Northern Ireland? Because I think an important point made by the Vice Chair in relation to a lot of these flights, they aren't direct from Northern Ireland, so there, there is an element of travel for anybody that, that will partake in them. So we just would like to get a, a thinking behind the, the conversations and the engagement uh, from Northern Ireland and indeed the UK government with the Republic of Ireland. Uh, Lane, would you be, mind, you may have got more information going back several months than I might have in relation to yeah. these ongoing discussions. Yeah, yeah so um, from, the, from the outset, and. Uh, uh, the committee will be aware that, that the CMO's meeting um, has talked about the, the epidemiology north and south, uh, and they do that every week. Um, in terms of travel intra-Ireland, so that's a, as a general issue, uh, it isn't necessarily something that we would we are considering as part of our restrictions. Um, I guess there's been two levels of engagement with Dublin. There is engagement with Dublin on the general situation of COVID, and that is largely where the CMO engagement and the meetings chaired by CMO would, would be the main forum for those. 
um, the engagement with Dublin on international travel specifically um, hasn't been on that on those meetings every uh, meeting lately uh, and so we are engaging separately with colleagues in the Department of Health in the South on those issues and also through um, our colleagues in the UK who have direct connections to the Irish government as well. Yeah, and in relation to that, it is, it is an important point. When we, when we cast our minds back to the very first case in this country, uh, someone flew into Dublin, travelled on public transport back to their home here in the north, demonstrating in one journey the risks and the challenges that we have in dealing with this. We've heard from our international panel earlier, um, and it's, it's very true, that uh, the, the, the virus doesn't recognise, not, not only does not recognise borders, it doesn't recognise politics either. And I think we probably are concerned to still hear of issues of communication. And I hold, and I, I think it's relevant that we focus on south-north in terms of uh, quality of those communications as well as north-south. Um, but can you advise, is there any um, structured work going on to address those gaps in communication and to implement improvement so that we do see a really, a really better a coordination in terms of our, our efforts in this regard? Um, well, I guess I, I'm not sure whether it would, would be structured and in, 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 it depends, I suppose, on your understanding of structured, but we do have point to point connections with Dublin. We, we have been emailing um, constantly uh, right up until this week, trying to find resolutions and exchanging uh, questions and ideas. Um, I guess uh, the main issue is the Southern Forum um, doesn't necessarily require full information to be given um, if you're heading to the Northern Ireland and the, whilst um, the per people arriving into Dublin are legally required to complete the UK form, understanding of that is low. So we, we've also been focusing on communications and trying to improve the understanding of travellers through Dublin who are coming to Northern Ireland. Uh, and we've worked all, right, most recently with Department for Infrastructure to get publicity onto the public transport routes that do remain in place uh, in, in case passengers are using those to come north on, uh, which I think will at least partially address um, the query, uh, the chair that you raised about um, the initial case. Um, so it, it isn't um, something that has an easy solution. We, we do continue to press. Uh, I think changes would probably be needed um, to information sharing uh, north and south um, potentially changes to the Irish form if if we were to collect um, Northern Ireland bound passenger information that way or um, we would need another way to uh, to increase um, compliance with the UK form. We are continuing to work on a number of, of ideas and, and solutions that, that may be able to be put in place but at this point we, we haven't reached a concrete resolution. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thank, uh, I want to thank Brian and Elaine for coming along today for answering our questions uh, and we will continue on with our consideration of those, of those issues. Thank you, Elaine and Brian. All the best. Um, thank you, Chair. It, it, does, it does strike me there, members, this is a recurring and it's actually not really good enough that it's a recurring theme. It needs sorted and needs dealt with. We had written at an earlier point to... At, at that time, the programme for government talks were, were going on in the south, and there was an interim sort of COVID committee, and we had written. But I wonder, should we consider doing some kind of a joint meeting with the health? There's now a health committee constituted in the south to discuss the, some of these issues and concerns between the two committees. Would members think that would... Uh, yes, Chair? Yeah, Chair, I wouldn't be opposed to that at all. And I think we were due to have the joint, uh, both CMOs. I think it was meant to be like last month or something, so I don't know what happened with that. Um, but I'd be, you know, for exploring greater cooperation, and I think there seems to be some hesitancy from the, the coalition government in the South to either not explore it properly or to, you know, uh, limit it. So I'd be for, you know, increasing any scrutiny and any uh, possibility of greater uh, action across the island. Paula? I think if we were going to do some joint meeting or something, I think it would go further than just the travel restrictions because obviously we see this week that restaurants and shops I think are open on one side of the board and they're still closed here. So there are, there are wider issues there around public health and community transmission potential. Okay. Um, okay, so members be content that we, we write to the health committee in the South and ask for a joint a joint meeting virtually or however we can manage it within the within the current Chairman, I'm just wondering about the protocols of it. I mean, we're, 
I, I, I'm absolutely no problem with the with with doing it. I think it, it it would be a useful exercise. Always useful to talk to people, but I'm just wondering about the protocols around it. You know, uh, uh, you know, I, I think these things should be from the top of the pyramid down. And uh, you, you know, uh, uh, is the first minister and deputy first minister are they communicating and cooperating? Is the are the health ministers cooperating? You know, if, if we go in uh, on a solo run, as it were, are we possibly undermining things that might already been happening, or indeed standing on toes? Um, I'd say no, no, no issue at all with, uh, with with talking to people. Pam, yeah, chair, on a similar vein to Alan, I've just uh, maybe we could check with the executive office before we do anything further, in case that we are kind of. Uh, putting the cart for the horse. I just, I'm not sure that that would be. I, don't, I just don't know if that's just the right uh, in terms of protocol. That's the right direction to go. I don't have any objection to it as per se, but uh, I'll, I think I'll we should check with the executive yeah. office to make sure that. I'll take uh, I'll, I'll take Jonathan and maybe just check with the clerk then in relation to if there's any guidance from that. Yeah, no, uh, sure, sure, probably are similar concerns, but on I think it was Jerry's point. I'm not aware of it, maybe it can be said, but if the CMOs, if there was due to be a, a presentation, I think probably it would be best for us first to hear from, if it was a joint CMO meeting, if that was already in the forward work plan, I think you said that, maybe that's better first, because that helps inform any discussion. Um, I would share uh, Paula's, I, think it, I don't know if it was a concern, but it was a point that would probably cause me concern regarding you know, with two jurisdictions with probably very different phases as to what's mm -hmm. going to be happening. Do, is there the possibility of potentially, well, it depends whenever it comes before us, I suppose, but disrupting uh, a message or our, our, our body of work, which, which we're trying to achieve at the moment, uh, which is scrutinising our specific rec regulations, uh, you know, here in Northern Ireland, as opposed to uh, bringing an added tier of complication across the, con or the Republic and Northern Ireland? Yeah, and, and actually, I do think separately we should we should follow up on the request for the two CMOs. Actually, that as a separate issue would be a very very important briefing. I think to get some of that detail earlier. Um, yeah, so I think that the your suggestion came on the back of um, the conversations that we've been having for months now over issues with data sharing and problems, you know, with communication north and south. And we know there's obviously already structures in place with. The, you know, with the executive and the health ministers and um, the memorandum of understanding, but you know, and obviously we can't check out around the protocol stuff as well. Um, but I, I don't see any harm in opening up whatever communication we can have with the, the health committee in the south or with the joint um, CMOs, whatever shape and form that can take. It can't do any harm in having the conversation because it is getting really frustrating that we've been talking about these issues and we've heard from the minister and we've heard from the chief medical officer and we've heard from officials, um, but there's still areas of concern and it, I think from the perspective of the health committee, it can't do any harm having that conversation because it's out wide issues that we need to we need resolved to help with the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah. And I think we are seeing regular North South Ministerial Council meetings. We're seeing briefings coming to the Assembly. Um, and I know there has been intergovernmental conferences uh, or North South Ministerial Council meetings, certainly. Um, so we can check, we can look at, at the protocol and the procedures. And um, I think there is merit in us, in us sort of sharing issues of concern or issues of of scrutiny that we think we can, but let's let's explore that and also let's uh, chase up on the the invitation to the two CMOs because I think that'll be okay, members. Thank you for that. Okay, so we need to now go through item by item on the four the the SRs as we normally do, um, and I will return to the first one that we discussed today was. So, moving first to SR 2020 forward slash 254, I refer members to papers at tab 7 of your pack. This SR adds Bahrain, Cambodia, Chile, Iceland, Laos, Qatar, Turks and Caicos Islands and the United Arab Emirates to the list 
of countries and territories exempt from the requirement to self-isolate for 14 days after arrival here in the north. It also removes Greece, except for, except for the islands of Corfu, Kos, Crete, Rhodes and Zacanthos, and the sovereign base areas of Agrotiri and Dakhilia in the island of Cyprus from the list. This SR was made on the 13th of November and came into operation the next day. Today is the last opportunity for the committee to come to a decision. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No. Thank you, members. Can I ask the, you then, members, to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 254, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number 21 Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the rule? Are we agreed? Thank you, members. Moving on to SR 2020 forward slash 275. I refer members to papers there at tab 8 of your pack. This SR adds Bonaira, St Eustatius and Saba, Israel, Jerusalem, Namibia, the Northern Mariana Islands, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Uruguay and the US Virgin Islands to the list of countries and territories exempt from the 14-day self-isolation requirements. It also amends the list of specified competitions relevant to the exemption from the requirement to self-isolate for elite sports persons. This SR was made on the 20th of November and came into operation the next day. The meeting on the 17th of December will be the last opportunity for the committee to come to a decision. Um, however, if members have, uh, do members have any further issues? No. Therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 275, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number 22 Regulations 2020, and there's no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. <clears throat> Excuse me. SR 2020 forward slash 278. I refer members there to your papers on this SR at tab 9 of your pack. This statutory rule amends the list of specified persons who are exempt from the requirement to self-isolate to include those conducting essential state business. This SR was made on the 24th of November and came into operation the next day. Um, the, meeting, the meeting on 14th of January would be the last opportunity for the committee to come to a decision, but do members have any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that rule? No. If not, then can I ask members to agree formally? that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 278, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number 23 Regulations 2020 and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on then to item 10 is SR 2020 forward slash 261, the Health Protection Coronavirus Travel from Denmark Amendment Regulations NA 2020 and I refer you there to tab 10 of your pack. This SR amends the penalty associated with breach of the regulations by travel operators, setting the maximum fine on summary conviction at £10,000. This SR was made on the 18th of November and came into operation the next day. Uh, the, the meeting on the 17th of December, therefore, would be the last opportunity for the committee to come to a decision, but do members have any further issues at this point? No. Nope. So, members, then, can I ask you to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 261, the Health Protection Coronavirus Travel from Denmark Amendment Regulations NA 2020, and there's no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Yep, thank you. Members, um, there is an additional item agenda to consider this week in relation to another SR. It's SR 2020 forward slash 274. Um, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Amendment Number 16. The Department has advised that this SR limits the number of persons at a table in unlicensed premises selling food and drink to six people from no more than two households. The Department advised that these regulations do not introduce any changes in policy, but simply mirror the so-called 6-2 rule in the Number 2 Restriction Regulations, which ensured that the same rule was applied on the reopening of business this restriction was omitted from the number 15 amendment regulations in error. The SR also makes some minor technical amendments to the number two regulations. 
So in effect, it was it was applying the same rules to unlicensed premises as licensed premises. Um, yeah, go ahead, Paula. I, I think we just still don't have clarity as, as to. I think the the wording is they must ensure that no more than six persons, etc. We still don't know how the businesses can ensure in terms of how, whenever people come through the door, how they can check that the people are for more than two households. So I suppose there's still not enough clarity out there for the, the hospitality sector, especially if they're going to be opening in the next week or so or after Christmas. Pam. Thanks, Chair. And that leads me on to my point as well. I'd raised um, quite a while ago, I'd asked the question um, in around what um, specific details were required for the contact information. And I think the answer was that it wasn't actually specified. Um, and I have asked questions since, but it's not clear as to whether it's now in legislation that you need to provide, for instance, an actual postal address when you're given that information. Because it would make sense that if you are uh, putting those restrictions in place and you're saying no more than two households, that you would actually challenge people to, to, to kind of prove that, the, that they are only from two households or less. So I, I just would like if we could agree to follow up on that, to ask that question again, because there's no point putting, I mean, I've no objection to this, but there's no point, um, if we could do it better, you know, and if there could be um, an onus on the business then to collect the right information, that will then have to challenge people to either tell the truth or lie, quite frankly, when, when they are, um, um, you know, dining out at a restaurant or whatever under these restrictions. Okay. Just, just to advise the team, are just checking um, what we wrote because I, I have a feeling that we wrote you, that de that was definitely raised in one of the most recent briefing sessions in terms of what details were gathered and what how that might change. Um, so uh, we'll be able to come back to that in a few minutes uh, once we've checked. Okay. Let me know what has been outstanding and when we're expecting a reply or if we've already had a reply and so on. From my very poor memory, I think uh, kind of the only response I can remember was that uh, it was like name and phone number was generally what was what, what was requested. Certainly that so was the previous reply we got, but we may have written again. I'm okay. checking. So hopefully that will, will come back to us. But just for information, I, I do need to, to let you know that this SR was made on Thursday the 19th of November, and it was laid on Friday the 20th of November, and is subject to confirmatory resolution. The examiner of statutory rules has no comments to make in relation to these regulations. Today, therefore, is the last opportunity for the committee to consider the SR before the Assembly debate on Tuesday. But we have previously um, passed the regulation, the statutory rules, but asked for further information uh, to be to be considered or to be forwarded. Would members be content on that basis that we go to formal consideration of it? Yep. Yeah, go ahead, Clark. Sorry, just, I missed that. I can just update members now that um, a letter did go following the last session asking officials to provide details of contact tracing to be gathered by hospitality and other services, including whether a contact address would be pr requested. Um, officials provided clarity in that session in relation to the contact tracing information collected in relation to close contact services, but didn't clarify the specific details that would be collected for hospitality settings. That letter is due for reply by the 11th of December, but obviously, as the Chair says, this um, reg, this SR is before the Chamber on Tuesday, so the question could be asked in debate. So would members be happy to reflect that question in the debate as part of the, as part of the debate on Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, so, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 274, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number no. Two Amendment Number no. Sixteen Regulations 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Thank you, members. Okay, members, so we are now going to move back to our Care Homes inquiry work, and um, I'll just go to time and place of uh, our next... Yeah. Our next Sorry, did we do you, LB? We did, Pam, but... I... Yeah, go ahead with it. It's, yeah. it's just that it's kind of on the back of uh, the written statement that the Minister put out yesterday in terms of the... Uh, regarding the vaccine, and we all understand that the um, JCVI really has produce the list of priority for the, that vaccine to be rolled out and welcome that. Um, but I think it's worth bearing in mind that Scotland have moved to add um, carers to priority list in vaccination. I think that's really important. And you know, I would suggest that I understand the, the first vaccine has its limitations in terms of logistics, but it would be 
very easy, I would imagine, for carers to make their way to a vaccination site along with healthcare staff if that was if that was doable and if there was enough um, kind of vaccine to go round. And I think that um, we should maybe uh, be writing to the minister to ask him to include carers because it's really important. Whilst um, the care homes, you know, the the people that live in care, in care settings in particular, and uh, they, they are desperately, you know in need of visitation and we want to make it as safe as possible so I think it would make uh, more than perfect sense to actually um, ask the Minister to seriously consider adding carers and indeed um, care partners to that priority list in terms of vaccination in order to protect um, our most vulnerable so uh, that I would be asking or proposing that, that we do write the Minister and ask him to add carers and care partners to that priority Prioritisation list in terms of vaccination. Yeah, and and uh, I think I, I I think I think everyone probably would agree with that. I also actually it struck me during, but I didn't get the chance to ask it. But um, I would also like to know how we input into the JCVA. You know, in terms of what what mechanisms we have to input our needs. And as part of it was indicated, that's a conversation around and and uh, so further further information on how we on the mechanics of how we interact with that JCVA and input into the decision making. Yes, Paula? I much concur with that, I'll not repeat it, but I, I do think I was concerned that we have devol uh, a devolved administration here in terms of health, and I think that it seemed very rigid that they were then going to wait for the refinement coming from this joint committee, then down, down to, and I think that they're not taking the wider societal issues around the vaccination um, into account. Yeah. Okay, thank you, members. And just one other item. Just, I just wanted to clarify something. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Colin. Yes. Um, I, I know I had meetings uh, previously, and actually some of my staff team this morning had meetings. And um, as we understand that uh, people that live in the community with dementia are not on that list of vulnerable. Um, and as I understand it, potentially those with Down syndrome are also not considered on the vulnerable list. And certainly the dementia, the highest rate. Um, of of deaths within care homes, there's been a correlation between uh, those with dementia and that there's been a higher incidence uh, in the community. And I think it would maybe be important if we um, maybe asked on this. I certainly written today uh, the letter has been prepared on the back of that meeting to ask the minister that those with dementia in the community be included on the vulnerable list. For it seems quite obscure that they're not. Quick point, John. Just, just on the back of that, is, sorry, did Colm say there was a defined list of vulnerable? Because it just it would strike me that those issues should be covered in extremely vulnerable under phase two in January, February. Oh, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank, sorry, uh, is yes, there, that, that's what I was asking. Is there a defined list? Um, there, I think there is a defined list. Yes, uh, there, there was a list. There was a list in the early in the early days. Go ahead. Yeah, Paula. Well, the, recently they've updated it. It's the one that they. If you go in to look at the people who were previously shielding, okay. um, they will have a list. And this week, I think they added adults living with Down syndrome to that, but not children. So again, there's okay. a wee bit. So okay. I can maybe send you the link to that. Yeah, if you could, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think um, I uh, had a meeting with. Um, Dr. Tom Black actually recently, and I asked him about around um, vaccination and the priority list and whether there was an updated list. And his basic take on one was, was if you are entitled to a flu vaccine, you'll be entitled to the COVID vaccine as a general rule of thumb. Uh, that you know that individual GPs would not be challenging people, you know, for evidence of where they are on the list. You know, if you're entitled to a flu vaccine, that should entitle you to the, the COVID yeah. vaccine. And, and obviously the difficulty there is, well, first of all, one of the things that, that we saw that has been identified by certain experts as being a mistake was the taking the flu, taking the flu as the as the kind of model. And COVID has had particular knock-on effects on cures, which which has been mentioned. So it, that needs to be kind of that thinking should be expanded beyond just flu, I think, in, in a way. So it would be good to get more information on how that process works. Um, the other thing just in relation to a uh, unanswered correspondence, and I know we have had some items there, but Claire, could you follow up with the department on tab 11.1 there has a number of unanswered correspondence. Could you follow up on that? Follow it up weekly, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. One, just one point of information I want to make in relation to an earlier discussion around um, the, the uh, suggestion that the time with the minister had been limited as a result of the, in, the independent panel or other or any other 
uh, agenda items. I just want to make it very clear. The time with the minister was limited because that's the time the minister gave us. I have been asking and we have been asking for more time. So it's not our other heavy workload and very important pieces of work are ongoing, but that hasn't impacted on the time from the minister. So I just want to make that clear. Okay, members. Date, time and place of our next meeting. So we're now moving into closed session to continue our consideration of evidence on the Cure Homes inquiry. I would advise that our next meeting will be on Thursday, 10th of December 2020, beginning 9.30 here in the Senate Chamber. Thank you, members. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland